Hello, everyone. Welcome to the live stream. It's the pre-show. We are getting things set up here. Trying to get things set up anyway. We'll get there. Let's see if I can get all of the correct graphics to load. That looks good. Now we can close this. What else is going on? I guess we can allow that, disallow that. Uh, let's change the website. My Live A Plus Study Group is right now. Click here to join us. And that's at slash live. If you're watching this on YouTube on the live stream, then you can go to professormesser.com slash live to watch live and participate in the chat. If you're watching this in the replay, then obviously there's not much to chat about. We've already done it. You missed it. But you can always check in later through the calendar, professormesser.com slash calendar. All right. What else do we need to do here other than uh, get our chair right? Let's see. We've got uh, the website updated. Uh, what else? What else? Where's my, uh, where's my uh, desktop? Where did I save the thing with the stuff in it? I saved it somewhere. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, there it is. I wanted to show you outside my house this morning. Now, I'm in Florida. You would think uh, normally this is uh, not what we get outside Messer Studios. This is uh, the storm that's heading up the East Coast. It's, uh, it's a doozy. And it's uh, plenty of snow here, North Florida. Who knew? Happens from time to time. Not entirely unusual. But it's kind of nice to catch it. That was pretty good flurry. I thought that was a nice set of snow with the, with the snow. Uh, it was kind of fun. But now it's now it's fine. Let's see if we got a live shot of what's going on now. I think I can give you one. We'll turn it down so the audio doesn't kill us. And uh, right now on the live stream outside, it's pretty nice. What is it? Uh, 37 degrees. So the snow is already... It's not even on top of the birdhouse anymore. On the bird feeder. So... Yes, we will absolutely be doing questions today, Q&A. This is the pre-show. This is me trying to get my act together, is what this is. Oh, look, there's a... Oh, we missed him. Where'd he go? This is me trying to uh, trying to figure out what I'm going to do with uh, the rest of my day here. What else? Oh, we need to log into this. Let's log in. Let's get that. Oh, I need the other thing with the stuff. Bop, bop. You can find all of the questions, professormesser.com slash QA. If you go to professormesser.com slash live, it has all the links you need to participate today with all of the questions and everything else that will be going on. Ba, 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 ba. Um, what did I just try to do there? I, uh, I need to go here and do this thing. We're doing A plus today. So let's do A plus here. I think I've got both of these in this, do I? think I do. How many pages is this? That's just A+. plus. Let's do A+, plus, uh, 901, and A+, plus 902. We'll do both of them. There we go. And that's there. We got that. Uh, oh, I need to do audio. I need to record this. Recording would be good. There we go. Record this. And let's do some audio real quick for the podcast. I'm James Messer, and you're listening to the Professor Messer A Plus Study Group. This study group was recorded on January 3rd, 2018. If you'd like to watch a video replay, visit my website at professormesser.com. I'm James Messer, and you're listening to the Professor Messer A Plus Study Group After Show. This after show was recorded on January 3rd, 2018. If you'd like to watch a video replay, visit my website at professormesser.com. There you go. That, uh, that is taking care of that piece. It looks like uh, my tweets, did my tweet go out? My tweets uh, did go out. So study group tweet is out. Email is out. Uh, where are what else we can talk uh, we can talk cryptocurrency today if we wanted to I've been trying to pay attention to what's going on it's been difficult here in Florida we're not used to cold we're not used to all of this uh, camera check hi 
How are you? Hi. Uh, camera three, camera four. It's all working, people. It's all working. Uh, what else do we need to do? But we're we're so unprepared for anything that is icy cold. You know, we shut down interstates this morning because of the ice and on the we don't know how to handle that. We were talking in the chat room earlier. You know, do I what type what season tires do I have? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. We just have tires. There are no seasons. You just put tires on your car. If they're chains, that's what you use to pull the truck out of the mud. That's what chains are. We don't know any chains. I used to travel a lot. Uh, so I'm, I'm somewhat used to being in cold half the year because I would have to travel where it was cold. But it's one of those things where you, uh, you just aren't, aren't ready for it when it hits. Da, 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 da. You know, I used to live in South Florida where it just didn't, it never got cold. That wasn't a big deal. But here in North Florida, certainly gets a little chilly. And now that's going to go right up the coast. So we're getting it first. So you poor folks up uh, on the East Coast are just going to get uh, plenty of a storm. Uh, Grayson, it's, it's uh, the, the Weather Channel gives names to these storms so that they can reference them. Because otherwise, there's no name. It's the storm that came through in January. All right, which one was that? So they give it a name. If it's a bad storm, they give it a name. This is this is uh, Winter Storm Grayson. So that's uh, I got to feel Grayson today. And then now the, the snow is over for me. I was far enough inland. I just got a little piece of it. And there it goes. So not much more. I don't remember what we're doing. I mean, I remember what we're doing. I, I know where I am. I just don't remember any of the questions. And I didn't look at them. So we're just going to figure it out, peoples. Some of these questions were written up months ago, before the holidays, before I went on a little vacation, before this week. So I have to remember all of that. If you are watching live on YouTube, I'll remind you to go to professormesser.com slash live. And there's a chat there so that uh, we can talk about how cold it is in Ohio, in Indiana, in Dallas-Fort Worth, and Alaska, which is what we were doing there. Are we ready? Is it time to do something? Uh, I need to get... What was that? Da, 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 da. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, this is good. Okay. Uh, we need to go to Keynote because we're going to get this this party started. Very nice. Very good. We'll get this graphic here. What else is, uh, well, welcome, Zbit. Glad you made it to live one. Um, we are almost ready to go. About 30 seconds, a little bit more, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of thing. And we'll get going here in a moment. And we'll figure this out, right? I am recording. We're recording. You're watching it live. I think we're good. I think, um, I think we are legitimately going to do a study group. So that's good. Wasn't quite sure. For those of you watching, go to professormesser.com slash live. All the links there are for the Q&A, and I'll be talking more about it in just a moment as well. We'll do all of that. In the meantime, why don't we, why don't we get this thing started? Uh, we're right about there. So let's go, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to the Professor Messer A-plus study group for January of 2018. It's the first study group of the year. It's January the 3rd. We are live. Welcome. Thanks for joining me. I know we're back after a New Year's holiday, and I booked this study group on the 3rd, the very first Wednesday of the year. But I think we can manage, don't you? I think we can. We, we'll figure it out as we go through all of this today. We will find a way to make ourselves get through this piece. Uh, if you want to see the snow here from our world headquarters in Florida, I've got video in the pre-show. You can rewind and watch some of that. 
We've got plenty to go through today, though. I have plenty of questions. This entire first hour is going to be Q&A. So stand by. I will explain to you exactly how we're going to do that. And then the second hour, we just open up the phone lines. and We just talk about things. Uh, it can be A-plus related. It can be not A-plus related. It can be anything related. It can be, we can talk about cryptocurrency. We can talk about Xbox. We can talk about, I guess that's the only thing going on in my life right now, cryptocurrency and Xbox, and trying to get through the holidays. That part's done. So at least we've got a little bit of that going on. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, though. I could not do this without you. This is what I do full time now. This is this is a weird world I live in because I just talk to you and I create content. I put it out on the YouTube and it works fantastic. And you're able to view it. Every single minute of every single training video I create is available for you to watch absolutely free. And as far as I can tell, always going to be that way. That's exactly my plan. And it's worked perfectly. Don't tell anyone. It's a, it's a big secret. The idea is that you can also purchase a downloadable version if you don't want to watch it online. You can find out more about that at professormesser.com slash download901. I've also got uh, links here so you can find us on Twitter, find us on YouTube. Oh, and don't forget the vouchers, professormesser.com slash vouchers. There's a 10% discount on your A+, plus, Network+, plus, or Security+, plus, or any CompTIA certification. If you are a student, don't use that link. Look for the CompTIA. Uh, it, it's the, uh, the store that's for your academic. So search for CompTIA Academic Store. If you have an EDU email address, there's a little bit better discount for you. That doesn't help me, but it will absolutely help you. And we'll open up phone lines once that second hour begins. I will also be giving you sometime in this first hour a secret code word that you can use, you can turn into me to get continuing education unit credit for watching this. It's a webinar-based credit. You can only accumulate so many webinar-based credits in a year, but it might be something useful. I think it says here for A+, plus, you can accumulate four of those in a year. If you're watching for Security+, plus, you can accumulate 10 of those in a year. So you can't collect all of your CEUs just by watching me. Thank goodness. That, uh, that'd, be, that'd be horrible, wouldn't it? You just have to do this. The current A-plus exam, by the way, is the 22901 and the 22902. It's actually two exams. These came out December 15th, 2015. So they have been out for quite some time now. We've had a number of exams come through and be updated after about three years is what we usually see. So you should think somewhere around December of this year, 2018, because it's 2018 now, you should probably see an updated A-plus exam release. And then CompTIA usually gives about six months of an overlap. So you'll still probably be able to take these exams about a year and a half from now. Not sure. We'll keep checking in on the time frames. If you're watching this video after or near December the 15th of 2018, make sure you check in with CompTIA so that you know exactly when that's going to be changing for you, if it is. This is something very useful to do. Now, if you if you need to renew this A-plus exam, I mentioned the CEUs, but you certainly don't have to take the exam again. CompTIA provides renewal exams. They provide higher level exams. You can earn CEUs. There's lots of ways to renew your certification without having to take the exam again. That's my point. So don't, don't do that if you don't have to. The A-plus exam is two exams, of course. We mentioned the 901 and the 902. The 901 and the 902 have different things that you have to learn. They're basically standalone exams. You don't have to combine these. I don't recommend you take them at the same time. That would be a lot. You should, of course, have a look at the exam objectives. We'll talk more about that as we go through the Q&A today. Don't forget about my questions. I always mention it's always good to get Q&A. I've written a couple of books with nothing but questions. For both exams, if you got both books, it's 1,300 A-plus questions. You will not find a larger list of A-plus questions anywhere, and it covers every single topic from the A-plus exam objectives, as you can imagine, with 1,300 questions, which includes both multiple choice. There are performance-based questions in this in this book, in this ebook. I've got test tips in there. It's all digital, and you can buy it and own it right now by going to professormesser.com slash p QC. And a lot of people like the book. I like it too. I made it, uh, this book, because I didn't like the questions that were available on the internet. So hopefully that will be something that will help you as well. 
I've got some free questions just to whet your appetite online. If you go to professormesser.com slash pop quiz, you'll see an archive of some of the questions from our study groups. So these are very similar to the ones that are in the pop quiz collection. So maybe that's something that might help you as well. There's hundreds of questions there for the A-plus exam and the Network Plus and the Security Plus. You can find them all for free, professormesser.com slash pop quiz. If you're someone who is watching this live, welcome. You can see me. Hello. If you're listening or you would like to listen, I've got a podcast version of this available at professormesser.com slash podcasts. Again, absolutely free. Automatically shows up in your podcast reader, automatically downloads onto your device so you can listen to it wherever you are, whenever you are, however you are. Absolutely. Make that available to you. Now, today we're going to be doing live Q&A. You're going to participate with me. The way that you do that is you open up a new browser window and you go to professormesser.com slash QA. Now, if you're on a mobile device, you'd like to use a mobile device app to do this. There is an app. This is the Socrative student app that you would like to download. And it will ask you for a room name. That room name is Professor Messer, all one word, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E -E so you've got at least a little bit of of typing to do if you download the app, or you can just go to professormesser.com slash QA, and a question is going to be waiting there for you magically. It will take you exactly there to have that available. And the question that's there has nothing to do with the A-plus exam. This is a test question to make sure that we're able to get into the system, that we're able to use these things properly. The question is, in what year was the drinking straw patented? In what year was the drinking straw patented? That's an odd question. If you go to professormesser.com slash QA, you'll see a number of options available. One of those options, I wish I had my head on here. Let's do that. Here we go. That's me, and this is me. And you can see I've got a number of options, 1808, 1858, 1888, 1908, and 1948. Number of options. A number of you, I think, are just, who knows? I don't know why I chose this. I know why I chose this one, but you're trying to figure out why are we talking about drinking straw patents. Nobody knows drinking straw patents and those, and those things associated with it. Well, you're right. Well, this is just a way that we can make sure that we are able to get into Socrative and able to use it correctly. And hopefully you've been able to do that and you've answered. And you can see 56% of you said 1908. 19% said 1858, 12% said 1888. You get the idea. So, so those types of things are, are like that as well. So makes makes sense to me. Uh, that's, that's so true. Let's have a look at why I would ask that. What is the right answer? We would like to know what the right answer. Marvin C. Stone is the gentleman who received the patent for the drinking straw on January the 3rd. Today is the birthday of the drinking straw patent in 1888. And that's because January 3rd is National Drinking Straw Day. As if, as if you, you were wondering, what day of the year is drinking straw day? Well, amazingly enough, it's today, January the 3rd. So if you did answer 1888, how many of you answered 1888? 13%. I can't believe we didn't do better on this one. There's nowhere to go but up with our drinking straw trivia. Let's maybe shift gears a little bit and do some A+. plus. We'll get away from drinking straws, and we'll talk more about things that you need to know. Some of you are familiar with the A-plus exam and the fact that at the beginning of the exam, the first set of questions they give you are performance-based questions. These are questions that are not multiple choice. They are questions that are anything but multiple choice. They could be fill in the blank. They could be matching. They could be uh, put you in a command prompt and ask you to perform a function, kind of a simulation. So these are the things that are, are going to be important when you sit down in your exam. I generally tell people to skip over them, go through all the multiple choice, and come back to the performance-based questions. But we're not going to do that here. We are going to, and we're going to hit a performance-based question first thing the same way that if you were sitting down for your exam, you'd be hit with a performance-based question first thing. So this is a question that's going to ask a series of questions, and you have to decide which one it is. For those of you trying to get into the chat room or get into the uh, the Socrative room, the Socrative room is Professor Messer, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E -S -S -E Make sure you spell it right or you won't be able to see anything in there. 
Otherwise, you can go to professormaster.com slash QA because we're going to answer this question, which is upgrade or fresh install. Let's play America's favorite game show, Upgrade or Fresh Install. In this question, I'm giving you five scenarios, and I want to know from you whether you are able to do an upgrade or whether you have to do a fresh install. An upgrade, obviously, is going to keep all of your Windows settings, all of your personal files, and all of your applications. Do not answer in the chat room. You want to answer by going to professormesser.com slash QA. So you could put, uh, maybe call it U for upgrade and I for install. And then you can go uh, 1U, 2U, 3U, 4U, and 5U if you think that all of them are upgrades. So you can see the different options are here for those listening on the podcast. The first option is Windows 8 Core to Windows 8.1 Pro. Is that an upgrade? Can we do an upgrade there or do we, do we have to do a fresh install? That's the question. Number two is Windows XP Professional to Windows 7 Professional. Upgrade or fresh install? Windows XP Professional to Windows Vista Business. Is that an upgrade or a fresh install? Windows 7 Professional to Windows 8 Core. Is that an upgrade or is that a fresh install? And finally, Windows Vista Ultimate to Windows 7 Enterprise. Upgrade or fresh install? It's got to be one of those, right? You have to figure out which one these are. Now, obviously, this is part of the CompT exam objectives. Knowing how to, how and when to perform an upgrade are some pretty important parts of the exam, and you absolutely need to know about those. So make sure you go through these very carefully. Some of them, I think, are relatively straightforward. Some of them, maybe not so relatively straightforward. So we're going to go through all of them and figure out all of the pieces. How many do you think you got right? I guess we could put that in the chat room. Do you think you got all of them right? You think you got none of them right? My, that, this may be an opportunity to know if you really know the content or not. And, and I think that's an important part of this, uh, this entire process. Is The intention here is not to get 100% of these correct. If you can, then I've done something horribly wrong in presenting this to you. I'm trying to get about half of you to get these right, or at least get half, half of the questions you answer to be correct. There should be some challenge associated with this, and we're trying to find the things that maybe you could study a little bit more on before walking into your exam. Let's step through these questions. So let's, let's step through these five options and see how we did with this. Upgrade or fresh install. Let's take the first one, which is the Windows 8 Core to Windows 8.1 Pro. This is a relatively incremental update from a Windows 8 to a Windows 8.1. And going from Core to Pro is an upgrade. We can upgrade, we can keep all of our Windows settings, we can keep all of our personal files, and we can keep all of our applications in place and simply perform an upgrade. And it works great. Let's do another one. Second one is Windows XP Professional to Windows 7 Professional. And that one is always going to be a fresh install. Interestingly enough, Windows XP obviously incredibly popular. Windows 7 in still incredibly popular. But there's no way to go directly from XP to 7, unfortunately. You have Windows Vista in the middle, which created massive problems for everybody. So the only way to go from XP to 7 is a fresh install. There are some things you can do to help migrate, but obviously the operating system itself, a fresh install. Let's do another one. Windows XP Professional to Windows Vista Business. As I just mentioned, XP to Vista, for the most part, is upgradable as long as you aren't downgrading to a lower version. Windows XP Professional to Vista Business is almost a direct upgrade. It's a horizontal. It's a there's There's no up or down there. We're going directly from one uh, XP Professional to the like version, Windows Vista Business. The fourth option was Windows 7 Professional to Windows 8 Core. Well, here's an option where we're simply going up one version, but notice we're going from professional to kind of a non-professional version. So we're, we're going down a version. We can't go down. We can only go up. And because we can't go down a version, that's got to be a fresh install if we want to do that. So let's do the last one, which is a Windows Vista Ultimate to Windows 7 Enterprise. Well, it would be nice to go from an ultimate version. You would think the ultimate version is the ultimate, right? And the Windows 7 Enterprise, is it sounds kind of ultimate, but it's not ultimate. It's enterprise. It's a very unique version in itself. And the only way to get there from that version is a, is a fresh install. You cannot do an upgrade to go from Windows Vista Ultimate to Windows 7 Enterprise. So hopefully you were able to go through this list, get a feel for what those options are. Maybe now you can see that moving 
a couple of versions up and moving up or down in the type of edition makes a big difference. Make sure you know those different options before going in on your exam. They're, these are obviously part of the Windows exam objectives and the CompTIA exam objectives, the 220.902 section 1.1 for Windows upgrade paths. So make sure that you know all of those. That's the video also that covers these. So hopefully you did pretty well with that one. Let's let's get into more of the multiple choice. So you're going to go through a number of these performance-based questions on your exam. Let's now get into multiple choice questions. And the next one is, what port and protocol would commonly be used to share files in Mac OS? Which port and protocol would commonly be used to share files in Mac OS? Would it be UDP 161? Would it be TCP 443? Would it be TCP 548? Would it be TCP 389? Or would it be TCP 445? One of those, and that's the only choices we have, one of those would be commonly used to share files in Mac OS. Hopefully, you know what those are. If you think you know, Go to professormesser.com slash QA, and you'll be able to answer the question. Make sure you don't answer in the chat room. Don't give any hints in the chat room. Chat room is there for us to chat about other things, I guess. But pretend that you're sitting down at the exam. You are in front of the exam screen, and now you've been faced with this. Don't Google. Don't refer to your notes. Just take a stab at it and see how you do. We have to know about Mac OS. Those of you wondering, you got Mac OS questions and Linux questions on the latest 22902. And this is one of the things you absolutely need to know about. There's a little bit of this also in the 901 in the networking section. So make sure you know those pieces too. So let's see how we did. A number of you have answered already. So we're going to flip over. Uh, you can see, boy, we've got. Got a little bit of a mix. <laughs> Everybody's just taking a stab. We're not sure. It's got to be one of these. That's because the highest number, 30%, is our highest number, TCP 548. 26% of you said TCP 443. And then it's almost a tie for third with UDP 161, TCP 389, and TCP 445. So which one of these is it going to be then for, for commonly uh, sharing files in Mac OS. What does share files in Mac OS? Well, it's the Apple Filing Protocol, of course, or AFP. This is one very common way to share, file, share files in the Mac OS. And that's one where whenever you get into dealing with, uh, with Mac, it, you know, it has its same proprietary methods of communicating as Windows does which has its same proprietary methods of communicating as Linux does. Linux is a bit more open. I guess you don't have to don't necessarily call it proprietary, but it's certainly unique to Linux. So every operating system has its own unique method of doing these types of things. And Apple is uh they have their own method as well. And this optimizes things you're able to do in the Mac uh, OS 10 operating system. The file services for Apple filing protocol run over TCP 548. It works in conjunction with uh, the Apple Service Location Protocol. This allows the screens to populate so you can see all the different options available. Those run over TCP 427 and UDP 427. The, the goal for us, though, is to understand what this is. And it's file management. It's being able to connect to a, a, an external shared file system, being able to transfer files to that system. Those, those become pretty useful. You need to have that functionality in an operating system. And in the Mac OS 10 operating system, you do that with AFP, the Apple Filing Protocol. They're obviously the one we are most interested in is that one right there. TCP 548 is file services. And of course, that was one of the options. TCP 548 was option C, 35%. I didn't quite get to the 50% I was hoping on that one. But 35% of you said TCP 548 if you did choose C. Got that one absolutely right. Well done. Let's do another one that has nothing to do with Mac OS. Well, sort of a little bit. Nope, it doesn't. It sort of does. No, it doesn't. We've got different options here to choose from. By the way, that particular answer for the network protocols is from the 220.901 section 2.4 common network protocols. That's what that is. So let's shift our gears and do another question. I've got one for you here. And the question is, what mobile device component is responsible for determining 
which way is up? What mobile device component is responsible for, re for determining which way is up? Holy smokes, which way is up? It's a pretty important thing to know. Your possible answers are accelerometer, calibrator, front-facing camera, capacitor, and GPS. One of those is responsible for determining which way is up. Sort of an important thing when you start talking about mobile devices and knowing which direction is up. So when you take a picture, the picture is pointing the right direction so that when you move your mobile device around, it knows when you turn the screen which way is up. That's, uh, that becomes pretty useful to have. You need that functionality. We didn't always have that functionality on our mobile devices. It was really Apple that popularized that particular capability. What mobile device component is responsible? I'm going to take a sneak peek and see how you folks are doing with that one. I think a lot of you may be on to something with this answer. Let's see how we did for this one. Got about 70 of you. 68% of you have said accelerometer. 19% said calibrator. And then drops way off for the third, fourth, and fifth for front-facing camera, GPS, and capacitor. So one of these is going to be right. We think, based on the very large number of people that have, have answered this, could it be accelerometer? 64% said accelerometer. First, let's talk about a calibration, a calibrator. The calibration, this is for you, for the folks that have been around for a while with these mobile devices, we had these older uh, touch screens on our mobile devices, on your old Palm Pilot. And after a while, the screen would become out of calibration. So where you put the stylus on the screen was not registering at that place. And it made you click around the screen on these dots to recalibrate it occasionally. And that becomes useful to have that there. So it was one where uh, you had to do that every day or so. Because after a while, you'd click on something on the screen with your stylus, and it wouldn't click on it. Obviously, our screens we use today don't require any type of calibration. These capacitive touch screens are brilliant. They constantly calibrate themselves. They know exactly where they are and how they're working. So that's not something we have to do anymore. But we were asking about which way is up. And a lot of you said accelerometer. And you would be right. The accelerometer not only determines the orientation of the mobile device that you're holding, it also knows it's if it's moving at all. So it, it can, can recognize any type of motion in any direction. And you've probably seen this if you've used things like, uh, if you, you look at the stars at night, use one of those, uh, those star finders. You could put it up to the sky and effectively point your mobile device at the star, and it tells you exactly what that is. If you're trying to figure out what satellite's going over, it will point it out and give you the name. You can zoom up on it and click on it and find out more information about it. And those are those capabilities in these mobile devices really enable a lot of great features in our application. So accelerometers become really, really, really important. I did not put in the list a gyroscope. Uh, most of the time, the gyroscope and the accelerometer are combined together in this capability so that the, the, the mobile phone actually knows how you're turning it in any of the three directions, the X, Y, and the Z axis. Kind of useful to have that, to have those pieces there. So the one we were looking for in this, though, was the one that really determined the orientation, which way was up. And if you answered A, accelerometer, 64% of you, you did great. You got that one absolutely right. Well done. So that was one I didn't really fool that many people. I didn't really, I didn't get that 50% and fool that many folks with those pieces. So hopefully that's one that you're familiar with, too, and you're working through that. If you've looked at my A-plus course, there are little tidbits and little pieces of information like this in this course extensively for both the 901 and the 902. I have, I've got tons of videos out there, and I highly recommend you look through all of the videos and take notes on everything that you find because there are uh, details about hardware and networking and security and ports and protocols and mobile devices and troubleshooting. It's a ton of information. And you need to have a very broad set of knowledge walking into the exam to do well. What I've done is gone through all of my videos. I've grabbed the most important things. And I've put them into a set of course notes. These are a set of both digital and there's a physical version as well 
of these notes that are in a PDF format where I've taken all of those details. You can, you can recognize some of the pictures from the videos themselves and put them into these sets of course notes. It's just a way that you could have all of this already done for you and have all those pieces. Also, I have a book version of this too for those of you that like uh, something that's physical. I've taken all the, the course notes. It costs a little bit more because it's this color printing which is uh, horribly expensive, but I've just effectively passed the cost on to you uh, so that you you pretty much pay uh, a cost just to have the printed. But I send it to you. It's something physical. See, it's a real piece of paper made from a dead tree. So if you're the kind of person that likes to see it and work with it and go, oh, I can read it. It's a book. I like that. Um, that may be an option for you too. And if you buy the printed version, you get the digital version for free. So that's a little little bonus I throw in. Even though you have to pay a little more for the printed version, you get both of them. So it's a little bonus for everybody to have available. If you'd like to know more about those course notes, they are professormester.com slash A plus C N, A P L U S C N for A plus course notes. And there's links on my website wherever you go to find out more information about the course notes. It's also a great way to help support the website. This is really what keeps everything going. This allows me to create new content. This allows me to do live streams with you. And every single bit of this goes back to helping keep everything running. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. We really would not be able to do this without all of your support. So thank you so much. Let's get another question down. I've got another one here and available for you. Let's change my screens so I can see the questions. Here's the question. Which of the following would be most associated with an inverter? An inverter, which of the following would be most associated with an inverter? Would it be a screen rotation button? Would it be an OLED emitter? Would it be a Wi-Fi antenna polarization? Would it be a laptop backlight? Would it be a video contrast setting? If you think no, you know the answer, do not answer in the chat room. You want to go to professormesser.com slash QA and answer right there where all of these answers are waiting for you to find out what would be most associated with an inverter. It's one wherever you start working through all of the things you need to know. That's uh, That becomes useful. To have all, all of the knowledge. There's a lot there. And inverters are something you do need to know. Really not just for the exam either. It becomes useful to know what these are in general. I think uh, you'll run into uh, this type of technology often throughout your career. So that may be something to think about as you're going through the list. Let's see if we can. It is not a ride at the fair. A good, a good answer. Why didn't I put that on here? You notice a lot of the answers. I don't put my, if you follow my daily pop quiz questions, the fifth answer is always, a little something snarky, a little something cheeky. Uh, and I don't put the cheeky questions on here. We try to keep it all business, all business on the, on the live stream. But really, I'd love to put some cheeky questions. That's a good one. The inverter is a ride at the fair, but not one of the available questions, um, the available answers. So sorry. Uh, let's see how we did, though. What would be most uh, associated with an inverter? 61% said laptop backlight. We're not quite as sure of this one as we were about the accelerometer. 11% tie for second said OLED emitter and video contrast setting. And then effectively a tie for third said screen rotation button and Wi-Fi antenna polarization. So one of these is certainly going to be associated with an inverter. I think, I think we stick with the, the ride at the fair. I think that's a better answer myself. Inverters you're going to run into whenever you're dealing with backlights. Whenever you're dealing with these, these older dis displays, these older LCD displays, because the LCD doesn't have a way to show you what's on the screen. It has to have a light behind it to shine through. And it doesn't matter what kind of light it is behind. It has to have some type of light behind it to shine through so you can see the LED. The backlight inverter become combined together when you're dealing with some of these older uh, devices, these older laptops and older LCD displays that have these, uh, these older fluorescent type tubes in the back. These days, we use a lot of LEDs, and they don't need these inverters. But some of the older systems have these older lights that require AC power. Fluorescent requires this AC power. But whenever you plug in a laptop, You'll notice that you've got a brick that's outside the laptop. And you're plugging into the laptop, 
and it's providing the laptop with DC power. The battery that's inside the laptop is providing DC power. But the backlight needs AC. How do you how do you get the DC power and turn it into AC? Well, you do it with an inverter. That's what the inverters were there for. So the the idea is you'd have something that would create the AC power that would then provide the backlight and I'll really allow you to see what's on that LCD display. These days, you don't see quite as many inverters because you have LED lights that are much less expensive. They're brighter. You can have exactly the right temperature that you need. They don't use as much power, and they use DC. So it's very simple, much simplified. Sometimes we refer to those as LED displays. But what that really means is that it's an LCD display with an LED light behind it. It's not an LED display and how, how it ultimately operates. Still an LCD. The, uh, the older systems you run into, and there's still plenty of them out there, will still use these inverters. So if you're looking at the screen and you can, you can sort of make out a little bit of what writing is on the LCD, you got a flashlight and you're shining it, you're shining at the LCD going, what I can make, I can sort of see that. It's just very dim. It could be the backlight's not working. And if it's the older fluorescent, the problem may be related to the inverter. So if we look at our possible answers, the laptop backlight, 60% of you that said laptop backlight, that's the right answer. That's the one we were looking for. That is most associated with an inverter. It would not be the second most popular question, OLED emitter. I don't know what that is. Just made it up. It's an OLED emitter. I don't think OLEDs emit anything. So that's not an answer. And then... 9% uh, uh, tie for third. Screen rotation button. Sounds like it would invert something, but no, that's not what an inverter is. It doesn't rotate the screen. It doesn't uh, change the polarization of the Wi-Fi wi antenna. Actually, the Wi-Fi antenna is uh, one where you would set the polarization yourself if you're using that type of antenna that allows you to set the polarization. Not usually something we have to worry about, though. That's usually a Yagi type antenna that you're setting. And then you've got a video contrast setting has nothing to do with inverters. That's just setting video contrast. The correct answer, indeed, is laptop backlight D. 60% of you got that one absolutely right. And uh, by the way, just to, so you're aware, that comes from our 229.01 section 3.2 laptop displays is the video that has that piece in it. So hopefully that will be something that can help you if you're trying to learn more about inverters. Now let's do another one. Let's get, uh, let's get more pieces here together. I think I've got another question. Here's the question. Which of the following would be the best way to prevent the transfer of credit card numbers across the network? Well, you take the credit card away, of course. Isn't that how you do it? No, that's not quite the right answer. I have a number of options available, though. Which of the following would be the best way to prevent the transfer of credit card numbers across the network? Would it be a VPN? Would it be an IPS? Would it be a DLP? Would it be smart cards or would it be multi-factor authentication? One of those is going to be the best way to prevent the transfer of credit card numbers across the network. An important consideration with this question is the wording of the question, which says, which of the following would be the best way to prevent the transfer of credit card numbers across the network? And if I look at these answers, more than one of these answers could possibly prevent the transfer of credit card numbers across the network. You're going to run into this conundrum often on the exam where more than one question could technically do the thing they're asking you to do. But that wasn't the question they asked. It's not the question I'm asking. The question was, which of the following would be the best way? And this is not, often people refer to this as a as a, a what the best way that CompTIA thinks or the best way that Cisco thinks or the best way that whatever exam it happens to be, the CompTIA answer. It's not a CompTIA answer. There really is a best way to do this. And that's why we have this term called best practices in anything that we do, and especially in IT. What would be the best way to prevent the transfer of credit card numbers across the network? One of these is really going to be the best way. So, so it's important as you go through all of these, if you think maybe more than one of these could be used, you may be right. But only one of them is really going to be the best way. And it should really jump out at you. If it doesn't jump out at you, then you don't know it well enough yet. So it's one of those scenarios, one of those challenges. Let's see how we did with this one. 
Well, we are we are completely torn. We got a three-way tie for first. We've got 29% of said multi-factor authentication, 28% of said VPN, and 24% of said DLP. And then we've got a tie for second between 12% saying IPS and 7% saying smart cards. I guess second and third. It's a pretty big separation now between both of those. So we're really not sure, are we? We're <laughs> based on all that we know about all of these different pieces of technology. We really aren't sure exactly how to stop credit cards. Maybe taking away the credit card really was the best answer to begin with. If we're dealing with uh, traffic going across the network and we're trying to identify and or prevent certain types of data from traversing the network, then we're going to need a data loss prevention solution, DLP. So this is the best way to identify data that's inside of these network packets that are going by. We've got a many DLPs and many DLP solutions out there, but they're great for identifying social security numbers, for identifying credit card numbers, for identifying specific types of text. They are great for finding people transferring these files. I'll, I'll give you a story. So I was working with a manufacturing company. Uh, we were putting in a next generation firewall for evaluation. And it had a DLP function inside of the firewall that allowed us to look for automatically. We just say, click, look for credit card numbers. And we'll, I usually just turn it on. It never really catches anything because people are pretty good about this. Instantly, the alert goes off. I found credit card numbers. Like, oh, maybe this is a false positive. Let's drill down and see what's going on. And it captured a file transfer of a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that was had contained in it a huge list of customer credit cards, and it was being sent insecurely from one facility to another. So instantly found it using data loss prevention technologies. What's interesting about that particular product is they were sending it with Microsoft Excel. Now, it was not encrypted, so that was why we were able to see it. As you know, the latest Microsoft Office versions zip up the files. They compress the files. So this DLP was actually decompressing on the fly, looking through the data, identifying a string that would identify it as credit card numbers and then sending it on its way. So that becomes uh, very useful to have that functionality in there. This is a way to prevent what we call in the industry data leakage, where people are getting information out. It could also prevent somebody from sending information or getting more information uh, and leaving your organization with it. So as those types of situations occur, you want to have something in place that can look for these. And DLP is not just any one thing. It can be on the network. It can be on a server. There are usually multiple spots where you would do some type of data loss prevention and being able to see that. So let's look at the possible answers here. If you did answer data loss prevention, 23% of you answered CDLP. That would be the right solution. But let's look at the others. 31% said multi-factor authentication. And multi-factor authentication is, is a fantastic way to confirm that somebody's really who they say they are. It's a way to ask multiple questions about someone. Give me your username. Now give me your password. Now give me a random, this, this random number that you will I will SMS to you. Now tell me what your favorite color is. So you can go through this list of things so that you can really grill someone on who they happen to be before as they are authenticating. So that's what multi-factor authentication does. It does nothing to stop credit cards. So unfortunately, that wouldn't be our right answer. VPN would be the next answer. If you were someone who is outside of your normal office, you're in a coffee shop, you're at a trade show, you're in a hotel, and you want to securely communicate back and forth to your organization's main office, usually would connect over a VPN to be able to do that so that everything between your device and the main office is encrypted. If somebody was on that wireless network, if they were in the coffee shop, if they were on the hotel network, they would not be able to understand anything you were sending back and forth to your corporate office. Doesn't prevent the transfer of credit card numbers. So that doesn't help either. 29% of you said VPN, not quite the right answer either. Smart cards are a form of multi-factor authentication. So that would not be the right answer. D&E are effectively the same answer in, in that regard. And IPS, although many IPS uh, and today, many modern next generation firewalls include IPS and DLP, it's almost the same functionality built into it. There are ways to turn on a type of data loss prevention in a number of IPS solutions, but you're, you're sort of 
taking a one solution and using it for something it was never designed to do. 11% said IPS, but that's not really the best way. You might be able to find a way to stop data that way, but not the best way. The best way really is CDLP. 23% of you answered DLP to have that there. So well done with all of those pieces. I think that's uh, you need to know those. You'll probably run into those. Not something you usually see at home, though, is it? Not something that's really available at your house. So it's something you do have to read, read, uh, read up on uh, and talk more about. There is so much to know with these exams. Uh, you can imagine as you're trying to figure out what to do first, what to do second, what to do third. Uh, you have to know how to log into Windows. You have to know how to troubleshoot the boot sectors. You have to know how to move things around Windows and work with it. You have to know how to uh, pr do practically everything relating to Windows. There's some Mac OS functionality, some Linux functionality, tons of things that you need to know. But fortunately, the folks at GTS Learning have created a set of labs where you can simply click on your browser, connect to their entire virtual network of all of these machines that already have labs set up for you. And it's something that's instantly available without you having to install any software at all. I have it on my machine right now. I just connected to it. I'm going to run through the A-plus uh, lab of managing system storage. And they've got uh, six machines here that I'm connecting to right now. They're booting up. You can see they're busy as they're booting up. But it has a domain controller. It has uh, some Windows machines. I've got, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, install Windows PC operating systems using partitioning, file system types, and formatting. So this goes from the very beginning of setting up these devices and getting them running. In fact, I'll go to the next option for my particular lab. And it takes you through the exact screenshots of exactly what to do. I've got everything sort of crushed together on my screen here. But when these boot up, they're Windows machines. This is a Windows 7 professional machine. It's not a simulation of a Windows 7 machine. It's not an emulation of a Windows 7. There's a real Windows 7 machine here. And when you're clicking around on it, it's as if it's sitting in front of you. Look how fast that is. So this because it's all just screenshots, but it's a real virtual machine behind the scenes. And it's all these machines that are here to work with. This becomes really useful to have this functionality there. And there's special pricing. If you're someone who needs this functionality, if you follow my link, which is professormesser.com slash live labs, you get it a much discounted price, $109 for both the ebook, which is what I use to create these videos, and the live labs themselves. And my videos are embedded inside of the ebook. Uh, so that you've got a few options here. The ebook's 35, the live labs along with it are 109. A complete solution. If you're trying to study for your exam and you need more hands-on and you don't have these operating systems and you're trying to figure out how I'm going to get more hands-on and really understand it from the inside of the OS, this is a great way to do it. Go to professormesser.com slash live labs. You can learn everything you need to know about it and figure out if that's a good solution for what you need to be able to do. Maybe it is being able to work through those. And I want to thank the folks, GTS Learning, great folks to work with. Uh, I love working with them. Um, I've, I'm talking to a couple of them on Friday. This is uh, a great bunch of folks. I would not work with them if they weren't. So that's uh, something that uh, you can also take that one to the bank as well. Learn more about this, professormesser.com slash live labs. All right, we have more of a kind of a visual daily double, if you will. We've got a visual question for you now coming up. This is one, hopefully you've seen this before. Don't answer in the chat room. I have multiple choices available for an answer. But the question is, which of these would be the best way to connect this external hard drive? And, and for those of you that are listening on the podcast, I'm just showing uh, an image here of an interface. And I'm going to, and I'm really asking what would be the best way to connect an external hard drive using this interface. The options available to you are eSATA, USB 3.0, FireWire, Lightning, and SATA. Those are your five options. Which would be the best way to connect this external hard drive? There's our picture that you can go with. So if you're listening in, I'm sorry that uh, you can't really see this one. But uh, you can always go back to the video replay at professormesser.com and have a look at all of these pieces. Maybe that's something you've been able to work with. Maybe you've seen this one before. Maybe you've plugged in your external hard drive and it's got this interface on it. Or maybe it doesn't. 
And you can at least maybe figure it out based on that. There'd be a couple of different options available. I think some of I'm going to take a sneak peek, by the way, at, uh, at how we're doing with this one. I think this is one where hmm, we're not quite sure. I think we're, we're sort of piecing this one together. And it's kind of hard to see. But you're going to run into this scenario quite a bit in your career where someone will give you a device or they'll give you a computer and there's a bunch of interfaces on the back and you're going to see interfaces you've never seen before. So people in the chat room are like, what is that? I don't know what that is. That's, that's pretty common. But this is absolutely connector you need to know for your A-plus exam. People say all the time, the A-plus exam is just so outdated. Boy, are you, <laughs> you have not seen the A-plus exam recently. There are questions on here with asking things that people still aren't aware of exactly what that might be. So, oh, good. Some of you have seen this. Yeah, this is the questions all the time. Uh, Debbie White in the chat room. I lost the cord that came with this. What do I need to buy? That is like a very common question in IT. Well, Dad, you need this. Well, Mom, you need this. The holidays. We just went through the holidays. So... I think we all had some of that that we had to do. Let's see how we answered this one. Which of those would be the best way to connect this external hard drive? Well, 51%, if we were going with my 50% goal, said USB 3.0, if that is the right answer. 32% said eSATA. 11% said FireWire. And then hardly anybody said SATA and hardly anybody said Lightning. So we run into this quite often. Here's the picture again of the interface. It's got kind of a weird interface, isn't it? Kind of got two connectors associated with it for that. Let's have a look at what this could possibly be. Oh, look, it looks like it matches perfectly to a USB 3.0 micro B plug. Indeed, that's exactly what that happens to be. We're kind of used to seeing on the USB 2.0 half of this. We're used to that micro B USB 2.0. For 3.0, there are additional pins, a whole different section. They added on to it for the USB 3.0 micro B to have those there. That's exactly which one that was. Let's have a look at that other picture again. See, there it is. Aha, uh -huh. that's exactly what that is for the micro B. It would not be eSATA. eSATA has a completely different view of the world associated with it. It's a completely different connector. But this is one of those things you do need to be very familiar with, being able to look at an interface and identify it. And on your exam, you might be given a list of interfaces, and you have to identify them. So make sure that you become more familiar with those and being able to work through them. I think that's uh, that's uh, people are saying in the chat room, it's kind of a rare interface. Well, it used to be, certainly. We're seeing more and more of those these days. Uh, that's one of, one that might be, uh, might be very common on the latest drives. Anytime you want to get USB 3.0 and get this faster throughput, you're going to see these plugs. Becomes, becomes handy on the smaller devices. You look, look how small that plug is compared to the other 3.0 plugs, the standard B and the standard A. So you can see why they use those micro B plugs are so much smaller. You can fit them into a much smaller real estate, and they don't take up as much room with the, on the inside of the device. So it makes sense that people would use those. Let's do another. We did so well with the last uh, Mac OS question, didn't we? For some reason, I stuck another Mac OS question in here. So let's do another one. Why not? Here's the question. Which of the following would be the best way to view the system logs in Mac OS X? Which of the following, so I have a list of these for you, would be the best way to view the system logs in Mac OS X? Would it be Event Viewer? Would it be Logger? Would it be System Preferences? Would it be Console? Would it be Activity Monitor? One of those would be the best way to view the system logs in Mac OS X. Event Viewer, Logger, System Preferences, Console, and Activity Monitor. Now, if you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. You can answer the question. See, some of you are guessing. Good for you. And by the way, on the exam, if you don't know the answer, do not leave it blank. The only way you can earn points on the exam is to guess an answer and get it right, or, or know the answer and get it right. But you have to answer the question to earn points. If you try to answer a question and you get it wrong, they don't take any points off. There's no negatives associated with guessing. There's only positives for guessing as far as we know on the CompT exam. I think, I think we're pretty, pretty sure of that at this point. 
So if you have any questions on your exam before you hit the submit button, always go through and, and click something. You know, choose A across the board. Do a Christmas tree. I don't care what you choose. Just click on them to be able to do that. Make sure you know them and be able to work through them. So I, th I think that's going to help you as well when you, when you work through them and try to get all of those things done. It becomes pretty important. For those in the chat room saying, I wish they had wish they had Linux on the live labs, they do have Linux on the live labs. And the, there's no reason to have Mac on the live labs because the Linux command line is exactly the same as the Mac command line with the commands that you need to know. So the ls command on Linux is the same ls command on Mac OS. The trace route command on Linux is the same trace route command on Mac OS. But it's in the live labs. So those of you wondering about the live labs, Linux is in there. There's a, there's a whole section. In fact, here it is. Uh, I have. So there's the working with the Linux command line. There it is. So you've got a way. Let's start it up. We can we can start that lab since we're here, since I'm showing it. There it is. So they've got a Windows console and you use the SSH right into the, the Linux devices. There they are. So yeah, you can run some Linux. Why not? Get some Linux hands on. Learn about those. It becomes useful to have that. So questions. Which of the following would be the best way to view the system logs in Mac OS? Let's see how we did for those Mac OS folks. We don't know. We just don't know Mac. <laughs> that's, that's one of those. Uh, the, the, the differences in, in folks trying to understand. And the reason is that there's so much Mac OS now in the enterprise. There didn't used to be as much. And now the last place I worked, which granted was a few years ago now, uh, half of the devices were Mac OS. So if you were in the IT group, you had to know all of the windows that you needed to work with because the basic back-end infrastructure with Windows, and then all of us security people in the field running around Mac OS because we felt it was more secure. Because it was more secure. It, it was. It is. It still is. Is it? Is it uh, perfect? No. No operating system is. There's huge differences there. So anyway, we can have that fight later, mom. So we, <laughs> all those pieces. But we're so torn here. 30% said console. 22% uh, said logger. 22% said activity monitor. 16% said event viewer. And 9% said system preferences. So we really aren't sure from, from this perspective which one of these it happens to be. Which would be the best way to view the system logs in Mac OS X? Well, Mac OS X has a function called the Mac OS X console. That's the app. And that's a screenshot of the console app. You can see it is extensive in the information it provides. Plenty to see there. Lots in the console. And that's what it's called. Just go to the console. It's a single app that's in the utilities folder by default on Mac OS X. And very useful to have there. Now, there are a number of, of answers in this particular question that you should have been able to throw out. So let's have a look at the possible answers. We know it's console. So if you answer D console, 32% of you did answer correct. So that, that is the right answer. Now, I have some in here. Let's start at the top. Event viewer is the way that you view system logs in Windows. It, it's not the same thing. It's not the same application in Mac OS X and in Windows. That's the Windows name is Event Viewer. That would not be correct. System Preferences is another Windows utility. Doesn't have anything to do with Mac OS X either. And I made up Logger and I made up Activity. Well, actually, Activity Monitor is a Mac OS uh, feature. So that is a utility in Mac OS, but uh, Logger is not. Just made that one up. So the console is the really only best answer. But we could have thrown out Event Viewer, and we could have thrown out System Preferences right off the top. Although there are System Preferences in Mac OS too. What am I saying? I think I've got them in mind. Uh, are they called System Preferences? They are. So here's my System Preferences. You can go right to those. So you've got both System Preferences in, uh, in both operating systems. You've got uh, Console System Preferences and Activity Monitor, all Mac OS. So maybe if you get rid of Event Viewer and Logger, you can choose between the three, which is much easier than choosing between five. And choosing between five, by the way, is kind of a thing I do. Uh, on your exam, you usually get a choice between four. But I usually like to choose five just to give you more options to confuse you, to see if you really know it. It's kind of a it's kind of a professor messer thing, being able to work through this. So that's how you would view the system logs 
in Mac OS X would be D, console, 32%. Now, if you're watching this for continuing education credit, by the way, then you will want to go to the top of the Professor Messer website. There's a link that says Contact Us, which is really Contact Me. It's really, it comes directly to me. I read all of these. I go through them. And it will pop up a little screen. I guess I could even do it on my screen as well so you can see what this looks like. Contact, uh, go to the top, the Professor Messer website. On the Professor Messer website, right at the top uh, is a link. Let me get rid of all the chat windows that come up now because I'm sitting right here. So here's the Professor Messer website. And I've got, uh, I think it's the link at the bottom now. Did I get rid of the link at the top? It's up there. Here it is, Contact Us. There's the one at the top. And I think I've got one at the bottom too for Contact Us. So I'll put them in both places. Can't go wrong. So next to Home, About, and Contact Us, you don't see this bar. This is my my WordPress bar across the top. You see this Contact Us right here. It brings up a Contact Us link. And the Contact Us, you'll put in your name. You'll put in your email address. You'll put in a subject line. And somewhere in this comment or message, I want you to put that it's the January 2018 study group. And it is... Uh, you want to be sure to uh, to put January 28th helps me. And then somewhere in there, put the term console. And we we're just talking about the Mac OS X console. We'll use that as our secret word, console. So the secret word of the month is console. And that way, I will see your email as it comes through. I will be able to answer the email that, is, that has come through. Uh, and I'll be able to respond to that. So this one where if you are... Uh, planning to uh, renew your certification using continue, edu continuing education credits, I will reply to you. I will digitally sign the email, and you'll be able to do that, learn all about those pieces as well. And, uh, and you'll have the CEUs, most importantly. All of the content from all of these questions, by the way, comes directly from the exam objectives. And this is the question that comes up all the time for folks that are visiting my website for the first time or people that are planning to take their exam. They say, what do I need to know before I walk into the exam? You need to know everything that's in these exam objectives. Make sure you download them. You can go to professormesser.com slash objectives or simply go to the Google machine and type in CompTIA exam objectives. Make sure that you have these. This should be the first thing you read through, by the way before you even start studying. A lot of the books that you have have the exam objectives listed in the books. So you might already have them and not even realize it. They're in your book. Uh, these objectives are extensive. They tell you everything that you need to know for the exam. Let me see if I can pull up my exam objectives very quickly just to give you a feel for what I'm talking about. This will save your life. This is the most important tip I can give you for your exam. Let's view this as uh, two pages so you can really see these exam objectives. So look how extensive these things are. I'll zoom in on first this first section just so we can really get a feel for it. So the, the first section is hardware. Given a scenario, configure settings and use BIOS UEFI tools on a PC. So you need to know how to do firmware upgrades and flash the BIOS. You need to know about BIOS component information, such as RAM, hard drive, optical drive, and CPU. You need to understand BIOS configurations, such as the boot sequence, how to enable and disable devices, how to set the date and time, how to understand clock speeds, what virtualization support is, what BIOS security support is, specifically passwords, drive encryption, TPM, LoJack, and secure boot. You need to know built-in diagnostics in the BIOS UEFI, and you need to understand monitoring such as temperature monitoring, fan speeds, intrusion detection, notification, voltage, clock, and bus speed. Now that's just the first section of the first domain of the 22901 exam. That is extensive information. That's more detailed than any other exam provider is ever going to give you, by the way. Enjoy this while you can because the other manufacturers of exams, Microsoft, Cisco, VMware, none of them give this level of detail. Only the ones associated with really CompTIA are the ones that provide this level of detail. Make sure that you go through this and use it as a checklist. If you can check off everything in this list, you're going to pass. 
So make sure you know this detail in a huge amount, a lot of detail that's there you need to know. We do one of these A-plus study groups every month. So if you've, you've missed this live event, you're watching the replay, and you're wondering, when's the next one going to be? Well, it's going to be February the 7th of 2018 next month to have that there. If this is after February the 7th and you're wondering when the next event is going to be, you can always go to the calendar at professormesser.com slash calendar and be able to look exactly when the next event is going to be. Now, of course, we're not done. We've got a whole nother hour. The Q&A is over, but I'm going to open up the phone lines. We're going to answer questions. We're going to talk about things. You can tell me about your holiday. Who knows what's going to happen? We'll find out in a moment. In the meantime, if you do have to leave, you can always follow us on Twitter, ProfessorMesser.com slash Twitter. Uh, you can go to YouTube and subscribe to me on YouTube. I put three more videos out today for Security Plus. Find that at ProfessorMesser.com slash YouTube. Don't forget about the course notes at ProfessorMesser.com slash A plus CN or the pop quiz collections available at ProfessorMesser.com slash PQC. I've got both 901 and 902. Not just the 901 that's listed there. Of course, my thanks again to GTS Learning. Great folks over there. Find out more about their live labs at professormesser.com slash live labs and follow us. Watch what we do. Check the calendar. I am next, next week. Next Wednesday is our Network Plus study group. The Wednesday after that is the Security Plus study group. There's a live event almost every week. You can join us and answer questions. And, of course, we will be here for the next hour. If you have to leave, I understand that as well. We'd love you for you to stick around, though. We'll see you on the other side of this. Hold on just a moment. We'll get to the after show. Thanks for joining us this time, though. We will see you next time on the A-plus study group. Okay, let's see if I can get the phone lines open. How does this work again? How do these phone lines work? What am I doing here? Why am I talking this way? Let's see. Yeah, there's no one here, by the way, to do this for me. So I'm the one that has to set up the phone lines and uh, turn on my show. And then uh, I'll host a show. There we go. We'll start the show. There's a lot of buttons to press. You never really realize that until, you know, you have to start a show. Let's call into the show because I have to call in too. Just like you call in, it's on the cloud these days, right? So I have to call in as well. Do, 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 do. And Thank let's, you for calling, calling well, you're you. welcome. Thanks. Uh, I type in a thing here and I push this. Enter your six digit PIN number. Well, we know that's redundant. And then I type in this, and then I punch this, and then what happens? Welcome. Welcome. Of course it's welcome. So if you're someone who would like to call in, you're more than welcome to. Call in at uh, the continental United States. It's toll-free number, 855-785-7545. Uh, you can also call in uh, on Skype uh, using zero Skype minutes. It's a free call on Skype. You put a plus one at the beginning, 855-785-7545. And, of course, you can answer, answer uh, or ask questions in the chat room. I guess you could answer questions there, too, in the chat room at professormesser.com slash live. So, in fact, we got a question right off the, right off the bat from the chat room uh, from Tom that says, how does CompTIA score a question like my first question? So, if you were scored three of the five correctly, would you get partial credit? Well, how does that work? Well, CompTIA has actually commented on this and their performance-based questions. They have a frequently asked questions document that talks about performance-based questions. And the question in here somewhere says, is partial credit given if I answer part of a performance-based question correctly? Now, they've in the past, they've said, you will almost never get partial credit. Don't expect to get it. It's very rare. And they've changed their, their text a little bit. The answer is there may occasionally be a question for which partial credit is offered. I don't know what occasionally is, but that's what they say. However, exam questions are confidential to CompTIA, so no further information can be provided regarding which questions may offer partial credit, neener, neener, neener. So they're not going to tell you. The answer is we're not going to tell you. You might get part. Here's the answer. Yeah, you might get partial credit. Yeah, you might not get partial credit. There you go. Thanks for taking our exam. That's that's the best you're going to get. My recommendation is just do the best you can. If you 
get every multiple choice question right, I think you're going to be okay. You have to, the, I, and that's, that's, of course, you have to be really, really good to do that. But what I'm saying is that I think you've got some flexibility there. I think a lot of, I think a lot of the questions lend themselves to be multiple choice for those and having those pieces there. So we'll see. We'll see what, what goes on. But let's, let's go to the phone lines, though, and see what questions uh, are coming from other folks, like the folks at the 301 area code. Hey, caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Emmanuel. Hey, yes, you are. Welcome. What's your name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, thank you for calling. Emmanuel. Yes, I'm just beginning to take the, uh, the A1 certification course. Yes, sir. But I want to see, uh, yeah, I, I went online and said uh, if I get both uh, Professor Mesa, the, uh, the, uh, the notes and the PDF file, uh, they said I should be able to uh, do good on it. But then I went online. I don't understand. You said fifteen dollars, fifteen dollars, another one forty-five dollars. Which one is that? Well, that, let me let me first back up a little bit because although I think my course notes are a very good way to collect all of the information, the critical, most important information from the videos, and puts them into a very easy way to read through these, they don't replace a video. They don't replace uh, a good book. They don't replace uh, any hands-on. So I wouldn't count only on the videos for providing that. Uh, but that's that's one of those things that uh, that's a pretty important consideration is that the notes are exactly that. They are notes as if you were writing notes while you were watching the videos. Now, your question also talked about uh, the different options available on my website. So if you go to professormesser.com slash A plus CN, these, these are the list for the course notes. Uh, both course notes are available in a digital form. You can buy them separately. The 901 course notes are $15. The 902 course notes are $15. And if you buy them together, they're $30. That's, that's the simple math that we do on the website. Now, I have this option here for the printed course notes book and the PDF. So if you get the printed course notes book, you get both the 901, 902 course notes in a printed form. You get the book. The actual book is this, and it's in right side up whenever you get it. The $45 for this, and it includes the digital versions. This is 901 and 902 for the course notes. Hi. This is where uh, a lot of people like that printed version. So that's why there's a couple of versions there so that you have a choice on whether you get the printed version or whether you just, some people only like digital, which is fine too. Is there anything like lab or something? The I don't offer a lab, but as I mentioned on the study group earlier, if you go to professormesser.com slash live labs, the folks at GTS Learning have some great labs. You might want to look at those. And they're all in a browser. Um, they're they're so easy to use. And I was running through a couple of them. We were doing the Linux one earlier uh, for these pieces. So I've got the Windows console, and you would connect in and run PuTTY and uh, connect to these devices. Let's see if it gives me a login. So we're connecting over the Linux box now and logging in. And it's all in this browser screen. So there's some options there from the GTS Learning folks. I, I focus on creating the content, creating the videos. I focus on that, and I leave the lab piece up to the people that do labs really, really well. That's the folks at GTS Learning. Thank you very much, Professor. I appreciate the call, Manuel. Take care. It's uh, bye-bye. There's uh, Yeah, and you can print them out, too. Some people like to buy the, the digital version of the course notes. The, the PDF version doesn't have any type of, of of restrictions or or um, any type of of, of um, password protection or digital rights management, all that DRM stuff is just a pain. Um, it adds a level of complexity to people who are trying to read and get their hands on this content who have bought it, and it makes it hard for everybody else to use it. And at the end of the day, it doesn't actually stop anyone from copying it who might want to copy it. That is it. That's its own conversation we can have about piracy and and the validity of that but i prefer having the document be as easy to use as possible so the pdf that you would get you can absolutely print it why wouldn't you be able to do that it just makes sense uh let's go to uh the 703 area code 
Hi, caller. Uh, what's your first name? Where are you from? Uh, my name is Martin, and I'm calling from Virginia. Hey, Martin. Welcome. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you? Um, so my, my question is, I just stumbled upon your A-plus training from 2015. Yes. And I was wondering if that uh, series is still valid as of 2018. It is. That's a pretty common question that we get to. It's, it usually happens about this time when we're sort of looking at 2015 and we're looking at now it's 2018 and is this something that's uh, legitimate? Uh, the latest version, the exam, the 901, the 902 exams, the latest versions were actually released in December of 2015. Uh, so it's really more of a 2016 exam. If you want to look at that, it's not really that old. And CompTIA usually updates these about every three years. So we've still got another year before CompTIA even gets to a point where they're updating this version of the exam. So the, the quick answer for you is yes, the latest version of the exam, if you're studying for materials that say these are for the 22901 and these are for the 22902 exams, then all of the materials you have are up to date with the latest version of the exams. Absolutely. Got you. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. And um, this question is just for me after studying for the exam. I see like so many different exam prep uh, materials online. Which ones would you recommend? Wow, there's there are plenty of options. And quite honestly, I'm not in a very good position to recommend many of them because I don't use them myself. I spend <laughs> quite literally spend all my time creating content that I never have time to try somebody else's product out. Plus, I don't really have relationships with these other companies. They're not really sending me their products to try either. Uh, so it sort of works out, I guess, in the big picture. I just have no idea. There are some bigger names out there. If you stick to the big names, I like the folks at GTS Learning. I like their Q&A. I like their books, or I wouldn't use them to create my videos. I like their live labs. Um, there are plenty of other people out there with other QA and other technologies too. Uh, it may be one of those things where you have to go through Amazon reviews and other websites to find those. I just personally, if I don't try it, I feel uncomfortable recommending something. So I just haven't gotten to a point where I'm able to have that kind of spare time, unfortunately, Martin. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. I appreciate the call. That's that's one of those is really difficult. I could spend all day reading through A-plus books, reading through Network Plus books, Security Plus, Cisco, Microsoft, uh, and sometimes I do. But it's not really to determine if this is something usable. So that would be one of those things. Uh, back to the phones, the 631 area code. Uh, caller, what's your first name? Where are you from? Uh, my name is Chris, and uh, I'm from New York. Oh, welcome, Chris. So I was wondering, um, I wanted to, um, I got my certification uh, this past summer. Nice. Um, I, was, I was wondering, uh, what are some other ways that I could earn CEUs? Because I, I know you mentioned that I couldn't earn all of them by listening to your, uh, you know, seminar. Correct, sir. But... But there are some other ways to do it. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the whole CEU thing, uh, when you are, well, that's not the right screen. You don't want to see my calls. There they go. So here's the continuing education unit screen. Uh, this is from the CompTIA website. So they they tell you, here's what you need to get to, to renew your A+. plus. You need 20 CEUs. Now, these CEUs, for the most part, you can correlate back to an hour's worth of time doing a thing. So we talked about if you watch this, you get an hour of a webinar-based CEU. But they'll also give you CEUs for doing other things. So CompTIA has ways where you can take non-CompTIA IT certifications. You could take a CompTIA certification and renew your exam. Uh, they also have, by the way, these new ways of doing this that uh, let's find the continuing education section where you can renew by doing one thing, which I thought was pretty interesting. Let's find the uh, the renewal process. They have a way that you can see if I can find it. Thanks, 
CompTIA has this website where it sometimes can be challenging to find exactly what you're looking for. They have this one, one way, where is it under? Continuing education, and then where do I click? Let's keep going down in this list. They have these uh, single method, like you do this one thing and you're renewed. So I thought that was an interesting way. Oh, single activity. There it is in the menu. Under continuing education, there is, if I could get to it, renew a single activity. So this is a new thing where you effectively buy CompTIA Cert Master, you run through the whole thing, and it gives you enough CEUs that you're now recertified. And they have this available now for A Plus, Network Plus, and recently Security Plus, which they didn't have before. So a lot of people, I think, are just going to do that. They're not going to – some people do collect CEUs, and they go throughout the year, and they go to trade shows, and they write content, and they listen to a webinar, and you can certainly collect things that way. They might take an, a higher-level exam. That's another way to do it. But if you're getting down to the wire, and you don't have enough CEUs, and you're not ready to take another exam, CompTIA effectively has a way that you could pay them to take this Cert Master course. How much is this? 100 bucks. 100 bucks for the A+, plus, and it takes about four to six hours, and you're renewed. So that may be – that might be the easiest way for everybody, really. I think that's their intention, is to make it impossible for anybody to compete with that. Uh, but that may be the easiest way to make that happen. Okay. Because I was, because I, because I assume, like, I would have to, like, it would be, like, have to be, like, work-related uh, work experience or getting, like, an education. Uh, the thing is that, there aren't many uh, like IT related jobs out there in my area that I can find, and right. I don't really, um, you know, I don't really have like a lot of money to be able to, I guess, go to school. And I think that's why they've even said they list all of these different multiple activities, like you said, like go attending a live webinar, attending a conference, completing a college course. You know, not everybody has the opportunity to do all of those different things. And I think that's why they're giving us options now that you could simply uh, do it online with the Cert Master course and you're updated and you're 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 now done for another three years. So you, at least you have some options now. Okay. So, so do you know how how many CEUs I can earn from like, I guess listening to your uh, your the seminars? On the CompTIA website, there is a continuing education section uh, where they have a list of all of the things you can do for that to make that happen. So they've got. Uh, all the big lists of all of the different items uh, renewing with those different uh, ones. So under their how to renew section, I think is where it is. They've got renewing with multiple activities, and they'll give you the list of what those activities are. And it's work experience, publishing, industry participation, et cetera, et cetera. And they list out every not only what those things are, but then they explain to you in that list how many of those things you need. So each one of them is a little bit different. But it's it's one of these where you have to go to the CompTIA website and really just cram all the CEU stuff into your brain so that you're able to get to that. It's it's one of those that does does become a little bit more of a challenge when you start working through uh, trying to figure out all those different pieces. Maybe it's something that you can also uh, work through when you're getting those uh, and working through all of those pieces. But it's one, just go to the CompTIA website. They get everything there for you, Chris. Okay. Appreciate the call. Good luck yes, with that, too. Let us know how it goes. I think that's one. Having to traverse the CompTIA maze of CEU, I think they're trying to make it easier. But now there's so many options, it's almost overwhelming. You kind of have to sit there and then draw a line as to what you're going to do. Maybe that's what they should do is draw a line uh, and, and figure it out on a big map. Let's go to the 470 area code. Uh, what's your name, caller? Where are you calling from? Um, am I on? Is it me? It is. You are on, and it is you. Oh, okay. Oh, awesome. Um, no, because I'm actually um, uh, I don't have a Wi-Fi where I'm at, so I'm like watching YouTube <laughs> on my cell phone. So I'm like watching you on the phone, and then talking to you on another phone. Right, and there's enough of a <laughs> delay that it's completely confusing for everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do for you? No, but um, 
But um, I just wanted to thank you for the uh, for the videos. I've actually just completed your CompTIA uh, A plus series. Nice. And then um, I'm taking that uh, test at the end of January, and then I'm uh, going to go ahead and start my Network Plus. Um, my question um, is, oh, by the way, I'm picking up the notes. Uh, I think your your notes and the uh, the questions here shortly. But thank my you, question is. Um, um, I have the uh, the Security Plus. Um, I'm actually prior military, and when I picked up my Security Plus uh, certification, it was uh, some time ago, and I believe um, I just made the mark to where uh, my certification was grandfathered in because I think they just started a few years ago where you have to um, renew your certification every three years, and I got mine prior to that. Um, my question is, um, even though I know by book, I believe I'm still okay um, because I still have my card. Um, my question to you is, one, would it be, um, would I still be able to use that in the field? Would that still be recognized and respected? Um, I'm still going to go back um, and do the Security Plus to, I guess, refresh myself. Um, but after I get my, um, so that's my first question is, one, would that still be, um, I guess, recognized and, um, and honored? Um, and my second question would be, um, after I get um, my A-plus and my Network Plus, I'll effectively have Security Net and A-plus. What would be, I guess, a next step after that? So there's really, you've got a couple of things to worry about. First off is the version of the exam of Security Plus that you currently have. If you took and uh, passed a A-plus, Network Plus, or Security Plus exam prior to January the 1st of 2011, so this is a number of years back now. So you would have had to take it about seven years ago uh, or before. If you took it then and passed, your certificate is what they call GFL, good for life. Uh, it is the sort of the old version of the exam certification, of the CompTIA certification. Uh, if you took and passed any of those exams after January the 1st of 2011, then your exam is what they call a CE version of the exam. Continuing education is what the, the CE stands for. Now, there is, for most people, if you have a GFL certification, during that first year of 2011, CompTIA said, if you call us or let us know, and we will convert or, or add on to your certification a CE version, and it'll be good for three years. But even those expired in 2011, 12, 13, and 2014. So the situation most people have run into is that they've had to renew their Security Plus at least once since then. And this would depend also on when you took your Security Plus. One of the best ways to do is probably log into CompTIA's online system and find out what is the current status of your certification exam. Once your exam, once your certification is is uh, past its three-year period, uh, it is no longer valid, and you would have to retake the exam to earn the certification again. There's no way to renew it at that point. CompTIA has become very strict okay. with their renewals that way. So that's that's the first thing I do is tell you, figure out which version of the exam. You said you had the card, and if it has uh, yeah. a CE on it, then it's the continuing education version. Well, see, my um, I'm actually looking at the card, and uh, don't judge me, but it says the... Um the test date on my card is November 11th or 19th, 2010, actually. And okay. I know that was quite yep. some time ago. Yep, You're, that's a good for life certification. Now, this brings up the question you had, which is, do people use this? Is this usable? Do people like the GFL? And the answer, for the most part, is not really. When CompTIA converted over to the CE version, Practically everyone else did as well. And that's because there is not only a DOD directive, but it's more of an ITU directive, which is an international standard, which says if you are certified in things technology related, you will update that certification often so that you remain knowledgeable of the latest technologies. And so almost everybody, including uh, employers, schools, the Department of Defense and other other folks out there, they prefer the CE version of the exam. Uh, the GFL version might have a little bit of validity for a particular situation, but for the most part, everybody's looking for the CE version. 
Okay, so would I have to take the would I have to take the whole certification exam again, or would I be able to take a renewal? You would have to take the whole certification exam again because it's it's not okay. one that's currently valid. You never converted it to CE, and even if you did, it's way past its three year renewal to do that. Uh, so you effectively are not Security Plus certified for the at least intents and purposes for most employers right now. Okay. All right. So, um, so after I do the, um, the security, the A and the network plus, what would I guess be the next step? You know, that's a very good question. And it's a, it's a question that a lot of people ask. And my answer is for most people, I don't think a lot of people like my answer, which is, I don't know. Everybody has a different plan. And, and what I usually tell people at that point is that's your chance to take a step back and figure out where do I want to go? Did I, have I really enjoyed doing uh, management of operating systems? Maybe I do more Linux or maybe I do more Windows. Have I really enjoyed the networking part of it? Should I learn more about the switching and the routing world? Do I like the security side? Should I learn more about intrusion prevention and next generation firewalls and being able to perform logging and being able to manage security? Maybe that's where I go. Or maybe I do databases or maybe I do data centers or maybe there's it's it's IT. You can do so many different things. Um, that's the point where you have to figure out where do I want to go? So you have to be a little more introspective. And it's not an answer I can give anybody because everybody has their own path of what they like to do. And I usually recommend that people do the things they like to do. It just makes the life much better to live if you enjoy what you're doing every day. So uh, so the, the real answer I have is think about where you want to be in the next five, the next 10 years, figure out what you like doing and do more of that. Uh, it may be that you follow a Cisco path. It may be that you follow a security path. Maybe you follow the operating systems. Sometimes you stumble into a set of technologies you were never expecting. That's kind of the beauty of IT is it gives you those opportunities. But at least you've got an idea of what you want to do. And once you have that idea, follow that path. Grab some certifications, get some jobs, see what people are doing, learn more about that, and continue to grow because that's the best way to move up in this particular industry. Okay. All right. I had my last question um, is um, Go when ahead. you, I know you have to renew after three years or, um, and then they give you credit. Um, I'm sorry. They give you credit uh, for other courses you take. Do those have to be CompTIA, or can I take a industry specific course and get that credit as well? The the term that CompTIA uses is you can get if you go to take a course to get continuing education credit for that course. There are a number of courses that they've already verified that these will give you, but effectively anything that has a part of that course. I think they said 50% of the course is associated with one of the topics in the exam objectives. If it fits that, then you'll get continuing education credit for it. CompTIA is not so strict that they will tell you that, no, that Microsoft course you took is not one that will get, no, they, it gives you credit because it's Microsoft okay. and it's, they, they're, they're pretty good with that. Okay. All right. Well, um, I don't want to uh, tie up the phone lines. I'm going to give someone else a chance to ask a question. I just uh, appreciate all your help in the videos and the notes and uh, and everything in general. Uh, thank you. And um, I guess we'll I'll see you at the next uh, study group. Yes, you will, sir. Thank you so much. And, and you're quite welcome and best of luck. That's um, always a challenge to piece together what happens with my certifications and where it goes. So maybe that's something that, that can help you as well. Let's go to the 320 area code. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, my name is Noah. I'm from Minnesota. Hey, Noah, thanks for holding for so long. What can we do for you? Um, I just had a quick question. Um, I know that uh, A-plus certification is generally something that you want if you want to get your foot in the door in the IT industry. I was just wondering maybe what other uh, certifications would be recommended just to kind of get my way into the world of IT. It's, it's one of these situations where um, there aren't a lot of entry-level certs out there. A lot of people have tried. I think CompTIA is kind of, uh, they have found that A-plus is a well-considered certification as an entry-level cert into IT, and a lot of employers agree with them. And I think that's the, that's the secret, is to find 
the certifications that are recognized by the employers, because that's really what most people are trying to do is get a job or get a better job. The problem you run into is that there's not a lot of other options out there. And uh, Microsoft does have some entry-level certifications that are very Microsoft-centric, but they're very similar to the CompTIA. Cisco has an entry-level certification, which is actually the CompTIA exam objectives in a different format. So they are effectively the A-plus exam from Cisco as well. And there's some others out there like that. Uh, the What you run into is that the value of a certification is what most people will will have a debate with you about. Is it even worth having a certification if you know the content? And that that may or may not be the case, depending on what your employer is expecting of you, uh, as to what your geography or where you happen to live in the world. Some some uh, countries are much more certification-focused than others. The United States, we love the A-plus certification, Network Plus and Security Plus. doesn't have quite the same appeal in different countries. So it's just more of a cultural difference between those as well. The um, the real question is going to be, what does what are you trying to do and what are those employers looking for? And I think I would much rather have a certification in my pocket and be able to show it than walking in without any type of certification at all. Some employers love certifications. Some employers don't care if you have a certification or not. And that's just sort of the way the industry works right now. Uh, there's there's uh, the value to the certification should also be something that's valuable to you. Knowing how to use Windows, knowing how to troubleshoot Windows, knowing how to do networking, understanding the security components, and doing all these things at the command line have a personal value to me. I like being able to do that. I think that makes me a better employee. I think that makes me a more valuable asset for an organization. So even if the certification itself isn't quote unquote accepted by your management, it's something that makes you better um, and hopefully moves you up the ranks in what you're doing as well. So there's there's advantages either way in my mind. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Noah. That's uh, an ongoing challenge. Is how And some people will say, well, I, I've got experience. I don't need a certification. Well, maybe that's true. Sure. But I like going through certifications because I'm learning something. I like going through a Microsoft certification because I learn about SQL Server. And now I know the details of how to administer it. Now I can be more knowledgeable when I, when I talk to people about it. Uh, that's valuable. Let's go to uh, the 352 area code. What's your name, caller? Where are you calling from? 352. Are you there, caller? Yes, sir. Yes, you are. Hi. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Ed. My name is Ed. I'm from calling from Citrus Springs, Florida, right down the uh, I uh, Highway 19. That's so right. Very good. I, I passed by there recently. <laughs> what can we do for you? Yeah, I'm down. Uh, uh, good, uh, well, I was just want to wish you a happy snow day. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I think you got some little bit of white stuff. We uh, sure did. There. That, that doesn't happen a lot. For the just, other uh, folks in the country are laughing at us right now, Ed. Uh, but that does, yeah. doesn't happen a lot for us. Like this, There was white things falling from the sky, and it was uh, the zombies are coming. We didn't know what was going on. <laughs> well, I, am, uh, I have to tell you that I am a big FSU fan, and uh, I just want to say go Knowles. I uh, decided to say that on your call-in show. Because, My alma mater. Uh, well, Thank you, sir. Your alma mater. And... Um, because I knew it was that. Uh, my uh, question today is, I I just got my degree, my IT degree in IT nice. management. Nice. Uh, bachelor's degree. And now I want to get certified. But, you know, the callers before were talking about what should I get certified in. And my work-study boss at the school told me, he said, you got to think about what you want to specialize in, whether it be servers, whether it be Windows, whether it be Mac, whether it be security, whether it be something specialized in. And that's the direction you want to go. You want to find something because IT is so broad. You can There's so many different fields you can go into. He said to specialize in something and be great at it, you know, whether it be certain aspects of IT. You don't want to see the broadest, uh, but I do want to get my A plus, my you know, because I think that's like the, uh, the beginning. That's like the basis right. of your uh, certifications. 
Uh, my question becomes, I'd have to take the, the A-plus exam. I should have taken it a long time ago, back when you didn't have to get uh, recertified, but I didn't because I was busy with school and working and stuff. And my question is, if I take the 901, how much uh, window should I give it before I take the 902? So you, first, the the, 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 the advice you got, which was, Find something, find that, that niche for you in IT and be an expert in that niche is exceptionally good advice. Um, it is the one that uh, probably is the, the, best, the best places where I've gone in IT are when I did that type of thing. Find the thing that nobody wants to touch. Find the operating system that everybody hates. Find the, the there's always one application that just won't run properly and that is constant maintenance and is a constant problem and nobody knows anything about it and there's a big uh, sign tape to it that says do not reboot. You're the one who needs to be the expert in that thing. You sure are the one that needs to learn everything there is about that application, learn everything about, about that mysterious system, learn everything that there is to know, because ultimately, it's fear of the unknown. These are all just operating systems and files when you get right down to it. it there, sometimes you're sending this stuff over a network. Sometimes you're securing it. Sometimes it's in a Windows. Sometimes it's in a Linux. Sometimes it's in a Mac. But it's just data going across back and forth. So uh, as long as you take that approach and you become the expert in that thing, it is remarkable how that takes you to different places in IT because it, it not only makes you more knowledgeable with something that nobody else knows about, and they're so worried about the fear of the unknown that they're not touching it, and now you're, you actually have gained knowledge because of that, but it actually enables you. You become much more willing to go find the things you don't know, and you become much more willing to say, I don't know. In IT, you will be saying that a lot, and if you can just just admit to yourself, there's no way I would know all of this stuff. I'm the guy that sits in the front of the of the training class. And when somebody says something and I don't understand what they're saying, I'm like, hold on, you need to back that one up because I have no idea what you just talked about then. Uh, and I don't mind being the one saying, I don't understand what you just said. Uh, let's replay it. Let's look at it a different way. Help me understand what it is you're saying, because that's the only way I know to learn at this point. And the better we are at saying, I don't know, and the better we are at finding that niche and becoming very good at it, uh, the better off we're going to be. Now, your question was about the 901 and the 902 exams. These are two exams you have to take. These days, the 901 and the 902 are relatively standalone exams. There's not a lot of overlap between those two exams. There used to be a lot on the 800 series and before. But now, you could really study for one exam, take it, and then study for the other exam and take it and, and really look at them as two separate exams. And I think that's how I recommend most people do that. It doesn't matter which one you take first and which one you take second, but I really tell people, focus on a single exam and the single exam objectives, go through all of them, really understand it, and take that exam. Once that's done, shift your gears. Then you can look at the other exam and the other exam objectives and all of the things you need to know for that. And I, unless you have a lot of experience in this industry, you do not want to take those on the same day. You generally don't want to take them on the same week. They are usually a single exam you're studying for, and then you're really shifting gears. It might be months before you take the second exam. Technically speaking, you could take the first exam the first day it's available. So the 901 exam was available on December the 15th of, of 2015. You could have taken it that day and passed it. You don't have to take the second exam until the exam series is retired. So about a year and a half from now, we think the exam series probably somewhere in there will be retired. So that's when you've got plenty of time between the two. But you have to get both of them done before the exam series is retired. If they introduce a new exam series and retire this one, and you've already taken the 901, you now have to start all over again because you've, you've now lost your opportunity. But there's no time frame. You don't. There's a lot of people say I read there's a year. No, there's no, there's no time frame. You just have to do it before they're retired. Okay, okay. Because uh, you know there's no Windows 10 on this exam. And right. That's you know kind of blowing my mind a little bit. But uh, from from what I understand, it's like CompTIA and Microsoft could never get it together. One was always releasing the new operating system. Right after they put out the new exam, so um, you know, so 
it takes a little bit hard to study because most of us are working on Windows 10. We should be using Windows 10 because yep. it's got all the upgrades and yep. it's updates and everything. So, uh, but uh, you're going to get, I'm going to get questions on Vista still and XP is, um, that's what I'm assuming. That's absolutely that, correct. Uh, I'll still get uh, outdated stuff that we shouldn't even be using. But yet there are people out there using it. There are a lot and of I people guess, out there using it. So uh, uh, we, Windows 7. <laughs> you're going to be supporting it for years, and there's still people running XP out there. That's the reason they still have it on the exam. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not a problem. You know, I appreciate your uh, in, input there because I was just curious about how much should I give it. And I'm, I was going to give it um, about a month between the two exams that I want to take because I, I want to still have it fresh in my mind, but yet I don't want to overwork myself. I want to focus on one at the one at a time. I, I do I've tell people, don't, don't take a break. You know, slide right from one right into the other because the concepts yes. build on each other. And there is a little bit of overlap on the 901, 902 when it comes to troubleshooting windows with uh, the boot sector. And then it kind of slides into other pieces of that on the 902 that it's useful if you can at least keep it fresh in your mind. Right. Okay. All right. Well, that's what that's what I'll do, and I'll uh, you know just keep on watching your videos and stuff. It's been a great help. I'll tell you. Uh, you know, my practice exams I've uh, <laughs> haven't done very well with those, so they they still need a little work. So we're gonna wait until I start scoring better on the practice practice exams, and then before I go ahead and uh, submit my appointment for the test. That's the way that's to do my it. Plan. Because they're very expensive. <laughs> it's it's a good plan, Ed. You're right. They, this is it is a, a non-trivial cost to take these exams. You do want to be sure when you're walking in the door that you're ready to go. Exactly. Well, I appreciate your help, and I uh, enjoy your call and shows. Keep up the great work, and uh, stay warm, I guess. We will try. Same to you, Ed. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. It's uh, Some of you saw the snow going by. I was showing as Ed was talking. That was uh, outside the studio this morning, right in the back where the bird feeders are. Um, and right now, of course, it's all warm out. It's relatively warm. What is it? Uh, it's uh, 42 degrees, so well above freezing at this point. But uh, we don't get that very often. Folks have been holding for a while. Thank you so much for holding. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, Professor Musa. This is Gene from Jersey. How are you today? Gene, welcome. How are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good, doing pretty good. Been under the weather, but now I'm doing much better, good. so I thank you. Good to hear. Professor Messer, the, uh, thank you, the uh, GTS Learning, yeah. um, the live labs, uh, I'm really interested in it, but I don't see where it really supports the 901. I see where it supports the 902. Does it really support the 901, or is it really necessary for me to try to use the labs for the 901 because the 901 is a, a whole lot of application as if i need it in the 902 there is and i'm not sure why they label it just 902 i think it's some of the holdover from the 800 series days but on the 901 exam you have networking so you've got all those networking command lines the ping trace route you've got uh, configuring networking ip addresses and windows you also have uh, troubleshooting Windows and knowing how to troubleshoot from the recovery console with those uh, capabilities to do your boot rec commands for your uh, boot sectors and understanding how to do that. In the live labs, though, they have all of that, even though it says 902. In fact, it even has on the screen 902. They've got all of the networking pieces, understanding IP services, configuring IPv4 and IPv6 addressing, which is part of the 901 exam. Uh, they've got the troubleshooting pieces in here, too, for troubleshooting common system problems and being able to work through those and troubleshooting operating systems. Uh, Microsoft operating system errors, which are also part of the 901, and troubleshooting network connectivity, which is also part of the 901. So even though it says 902, it really does cover both the 901 and the 902 exam. I appreciate that. That, that clarified it for me because I misunderstood it, and I didn't look at it from that angle, even though I was trying to follow the objectives. But once again, I, like I shared with you, I've been under bad health, but I'm improving. So I think I'll go ahead and take advantage of those those live labs. But thank you. Absolutely. So thanks for calling. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. Question. Sure, you take care, Professor Messer. Thanks again. Uh, I, I was going to say real quick, yeah. are you considering doing some type of workshop in the future where all your listeners have an opportunity to meet in Greek and just um, learn more of you live and in person? Would you consider something like that? Because you're a great guy, man. I'm learning so much from you, and I just thank you for your professionalism and your knowledge. I, I appreciate that. I have not done a live event in quite some time. Um I did one, um, gosh, years ago in London, and I don't think I've done any since then. Uh, part of the challenge, of course, is just geography. I am in the northern part of Florida, which is, there's not a huge, uh, it's not like a, a, a huge uh, city that, like other places in, in Florida, like Miami is an enormous uh, area. Uh, in the yeah. northeast, obviously, you could be in New York City or anywhere around and and there would be people available to meet from there. I kind of do everything online. So I, I get to see people. It's, it's not quite the same, I realize. Uh, I have thought about doing more trade shows, at least going to more trade shows throughout the year, because a lot of people will go to those. They'll go to a Cisco Live, or Absolutely. they'll go to some of the Microsoft trade shows or the, the Interop type trade shows. Um, I haven't done any of those recently either, but I th it's something to consider. It'd be kind of fun to at least uh, meet up and have a beer and just meet some folks. Yeah, I look forward to that. I keep an eye out on it if you decide to to take uh, take that up. I appreciate it. Uh, Absolutely. Professor Messer. Well, I appreciate your call. Thanks for everything. Sure. You take care. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. There's, uh, I think, plenty, plenty of opportunities, plus a lot of these places that have these trade shows. It's kind of fun to to just see the cities. So it'd be kind of, kind of nice to have there. Um, for people in the chat room asking, is the 901 or 902 more hands-on for studying? Both of them have hands-on components. Both of them have command line components. Uh, both of them, you will want to get as much hands-on as possible. And I even think with the hardware, it's a different kind of hands-on. With hardware, you're actually hands-on. You're actually ripping apart the computer. Oh, that's what memory looks like. Oh, this is a CPU. Uh, but there's also command line for networking and for troubleshooting the, the boot process. And then the 902 is almost all hands-on at the keyboard and being able to know those things. So you've got opportunities on both of those exams for more of that muscle memory, for that tactile type memory to be able to understand those pieces. Back to the phones, we got the 682 area code. What's your name, where are you calling from? 682, are you there? Are you muted? Are you gonna unmute? You've been holding for so long, I appreciate it. I'm sorry I had you on the phone. Are you going to unmute? Oh, I hate that. I'm going to stick you back in the queue. Not going to hang up, but I'll stick you in the queue there. So uh, maybe we can come back to you. In the meantime, we'll go to 630. Are you there? Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Professor Mr. My name is Gail from, from Illinois. Welcome. What can we do for you? Yeah, I do have a few questions about uh, the a -plus certification. Uh, first of all, I just graduated my uh, my associate degree in uh, computer science. Nice. Uh, the, and I was kind of confused by continuing my education to get the, my 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 bachelor or uh, follow the path of the of the certification. You know, that's a common uh, 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 question. So now the, the first thing I wanted to ask you is. Uh, do you think that the degree is that worth it, or can you kind of make it a single comparison between the degree path and the, 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 the certification path? Well, the, the, it's a question that comes up quite often, and you, you do run into this, especially, I think, in IT. IT has a, it's an interesting world because it's about the things you know. Uh, um, it's not quite the same as computer science. Computer science is... Uh, is designing the computers and the software. Information technology is more of implementing or operations associated with those pieces. And I recognize there is an effort to blend some of those things together that will fail miserably, but they're trying that these days. I get it. I understand why they're doing it too. It's just not going to work. The part that I find uh, is important to know is that none of these things replace the other. Certifications don't replace a formal education. A formal education doesn't replace certifications. Uh, Hands-on and experience doesn't replace either of those things, and neither of the others replace experience. So it's one of those situations where you need to gather as much as many credentials as you can from as many sources as possible. There is value to 
a four-year degree. That value may be realized later on. It may not be an immediate value. It may be when you're finally ready to move into management and you have that bachelor's degree in your pocket, people will say, oh, well, you're educated. So now we at least know that you've got the skills that you would need to build on for this particular role. Some people I've worked with in IT, though, have no formal college education and have made a very good career for themselves without having any formal degree to fall back on and have become entrepreneurs, have become millionaires, but don't have a college degree. Was it more difficult for them? I think if you talk to them, they wish they would have had it. But I, looking at their career, I don't see where it ever stopped them because sometimes it's what you know, not where you went to school. It's always going to be this way, though, that there's going to be a balance of all of those. And if you don't get a formal degree, you're going to have to rely on those other things much more heavily to be able to move forward. If you have all of them, you can kind of balance it out. Uh, it's really going to depend on what you do as a career, where you work, what your employer is looking for, and ultimately what your final goal is going to be. Yeah, my uh, thank you for that. And my other question is, I'm kind of new in this country, and I was, you know, I'm trying to find my way to to move up. And um, uh, I was thinking by doing um, maybe the A plus to start kind of building my work history to while I'm going to school. So that's the reason why uh, from this semester I've, I've chosen to kind of take the online class and then try to uh, get that uh, A plus education and start building my my, my, my working history. But I just listened to you when you were an, uh, answering for one, uh, one of the callers about the renewing requirements. So you, you need to have all this work experience, go through all these steps. Right. So that kind of uh, made me feel a little bit like, wow. So am I going to meet all these going to school at the same time? Or, you know, am I going to have enough time to fill up all these requirements for renewing, you know, my certification in case that I choose that path or you know, I was kind of concerned about that. Well, there's there's a couple of things to think about along those lines. Uh, from a renewal perspective, CompTIA does have all of these different methods to renew. And some of them could be uh, taking a course or going to a trade show or listening to a podcast or listening to a webinar. They have all those, but they also have that one-step process for renewing these days too. For people like you, who's you may not even have the opportunity to do some of these other CEU content events, but you could pay CompTIA 100 bucks, take their test, and you effectively have renewed for the next three years. So there, there are ways around that. Don't worry so much about that. But I like that you've kind of approached this as I'm taking these courses, I'm getting this degree, I need to go beyond this a bit. And I think a lot of uh, universities and schools don't do this, is there's a practical side to A plus that I wish more people knew whether they take the certification or not, just take the class and understand more about how Windows works and understand how to troubleshoot. It becomes really important to know that content. And I think it will help you regardless of what you do in IT. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Absolutely. I, I want to appreciate your call. And let, let us know as, as you're going through that path and trying to figure out do I take the next step? Do I get certifications? Do I combine it? Let us know. Give us a call back. Okay. Thank you so much. I will. <laughs> thank you, sir. Take care. That's, uh, that's always a challenge is to figure out which path is the right one for you. Uh, sometimes you figure it out. Sometimes it takes a couple starts to figure it out. Uh, I've never made all the right decisions in my career. Whenever I've moved from job to job, sometimes it was a fantastic decision. Sometimes it was an awful decision. Uh, but I think you need the awful decisions to help you learn what not to do again. And sometimes that's the secret, is knowing what not to do as much as it is knowing what to do. Let's go back to the 682 area code that we didn't hear from before. Are you there, caller? What's your name? 682 here from Dallas, hey, Texas. Hey, Dallas, uh, check it uh, in. Howdy. Hey, I, I made it back. Apparently, I my Bluetooth headset went out, and I don't know how to work a cell phone. The story of my but, life. Um, I'd like, yeah, uh, obligatory thank you for everything you put out there for us. Great stuff. 
um, it's helping me save money and also give me the opportunity to fit studying in between work Excellent. on a day-to-day basis. So thank you, as always. Very welcome, um, I have a couple quick questions for you, as everyone else does. Um, I'm having a hard time finding daily uses or something to use these command line prompts with um, in my day-to-day life. Is that something that the Live Labs teaches, or can you maybe recommend some daily applications where I can start, you know, inputting these small commands um, that really, when I see them done, um, you know, by my seniors and people above me, it just looks like it's just so much easier as far as far as file directory and whatnot. But me not having so much information on said computers or whatnot, I'm having a really hard time trying to apply that, which is the best way for me to get hands on and learn. You know, some of these commands that you learn on the A-plus exam are commands you will rarely use, but they're so important, especially the ones for, for updating boot sectors, for example. So rare that you would use that particular command. But when you need to use it, that's a really important one that you need to know because it could get your system back up and running again. Other commands you find that you're using all the time. Uh, I'll take, give you an example. Just yesterday, there was an outage on my local network. Yesterday, the day before, um, the, the internet went away. So this happens occasionally. The internet just disappeared. So my question was, is it something on my side? Is it something with my carrier? Is it something I have, a, I have Comcast cable modem? Is it something further into the, the internet? Where was it? So it gave me an opportunity to run a trace route and run some pings and figure out how far could I ping outside my network? How far was I getting? And it was showing me that it wasn't going any farther than my local network. I then referenced my local router. And sure enough, it said there was no signal coming from Comcast. So there was happened to be a power outage. It took out their local point of presence in my particular part of the city. And that's why it broke. But it was an opportunity for me to use ping, to use trace route, to use some of my troubleshooting skills for networking and figure out where is the problem. And then once I determined where the problem was, uh, all of my children came out of their rooms because the internet was down. They were zombies. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. Dad, the internet's down. What are we mm -hmm. going to do? We're going to look at each other and talk. Um, and so I set up my laptop to just ping constantly. And as soon as the pings started firing off, they all... Uh, uh, leapt up, uh, yelled hip, hip, hooray, and then went back to their rooms. So it was a, it was an opportunity to use some of those things that were in the A-plus exam to do something practical. So there are times when you're just going to use it all the time. And when I was day-to-day -day installing next-generation firewalls, configuring them, setting up these rules, I was using the ping and the trace route, these utilities, all the time, every day, multiple times a day. I guess it really just depends on what you end up doing. Good deal. Sounds good. Um, definitely helps. A lot of stuff that I heard while sitting on hold before a dead Bluetooth um, actually answered quite a few of my questions. Uh, your live session today really applied. I'm glad I made it to it. Um, as far as the Live Labs go, does Live Labs set you up in practical situations to apply these command lines? Like maybe you're set up and they're saying, hey, you have server here, you have your user here, here, and here, and here's the issue, troubleshoot. Is it like that, or does it give you kind of an open play um, area? It, it's sort of both. Uh, they do have formal labs here. So if you want to set up uh, virtual printing, they have a lab that steps you through how to print to PDF, how to print to XPS, how to print to a file. You know, those are topics directly from the CompT exam objectives. So they set up a network for you, and they just take you through the steps of how do I create a PDF? How do I print to an XPS? They, they show you exactly how to do it. And it's a step-by-step -step in their instructions with screenshots. So they take you every step of the way and kind of hold your hand and walk you down the path. And you can choose to follow their instructions, or you can choose to try it on your own. But what they're setting up for you is a Windows VM. So it's a full-blown Windows Server, Windows 7 Professional, Windows 8.1. You've got a full Windows system to work with, and you don't even have to follow their instructions. You could play solitaire all day. 
on the Windows. It, it, it's, it's completely open. It's a virtual machine as if you were sitting in front of it at your desk in your own facility. So it's you've got complete control over what you want to do with all of those pieces. Knock yourself out. If you think you want to spend your time going through each individual part of the lab, you can follow it to the letter. If you just want free play, you want to break windows and try to fix it, you can do it in their labs as well. It's up to you. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, one last quick question for you. If I was trying or interested in building um, a computer at home strictly for virtual reality and something maybe even above my level and something kind of far-fetched, can you recommend a CPU um, to start building around that's not going to cost me twelve or $1,800? Yeah, in fact... Uh, I I just bought for for the holidays. I bought my kids all the parts that they would need to update and upgrade their VM system. We've got uh, a vibe here, so I've got them. Uh, I bought all the pieces, so they unwrapped a power supply, they unwrapped a motherboard, they unwrapped a CPU, they unwrapped a cooler, they unwrapped the memory, <laughs> they unwrapped all the pieces. And then I said, now you have to put it together. They un unwrapped the case. That's, that's um, awesome. And I kind of sent awesome. them off. And, that's what I like to do. <laughs> yeah. And it, that's a lot of fun because now you're, and I think it's also not just educational, but now you can really manage that system because you know it from the ground up. There was no mystery as to how this thing was put together. Um, and we we went through, and I went through a number of different options because there's obviously a huge price range you can go through. You could do this for $800. You can do it for $1,800. Um, so I went through a number of different iterations. Uh, the place I always go for this is PC Part Picker. Go to PCPartPicker.com. I don't even know these folks. I've never, you know, they, they have their own business going here. I just like to use them. They're, they're not a sponsor of anything I do. I use them all the time because not only do they have build guides in here. In fact, right on the front page is an entry-level gaming build for 538 bucks, a modest gaming build for 823 bucks, and an excellent gaming build for 1298 uh, And they've already built it all out. If you wanted to build it yourself from scratch, maybe there's a particular motherboard you like. Or maybe there's a particular CPU that you think kind of fits into what you're trying to do. You can combine them in PC Part Picker, and it will tell you if they're not compatible with each other. So if you pick a motherboard, it says, well, you can choose from these CPUs. And then you can find the one with the dollar amount that fits and slide it into the mix, and you know they're going to work together. And then you say, well, I need memory. Well, how much do you need? I need this much. Well, here's the options available, and they'll slide that one into the build. And then you can build it all out, and uh, they even have some interesting functions on there that will find the cheapest price for you at different places online, and even ones that have rebates, and there's there's ways you can save money there as well. Uh, I think they make most of their money through affiliates to these, but their, their service is amazing because I was able to build out two or three different systems before I ever really found the right motherboard I wanted and the right uh, CPU combination, because that's really where everything starts. Once you have those, everything else sort of falls into the mix. Um, that's a great resource. And they don't just have gaming builds. They have completed builds that you could go through that other people have done for VM, for gaming, for streaming, for whatever it happens to be. You've got plenty of options out there uh, and plenty to go through. It's There's a lot of other sites on the internet that do this, but I love using PC Part Picker probably the most. Awesome. I'm going to look into that. I've heard good things, but really haven't spent much time on their website but here you know you can pick a motherboard or pick you know everything and they're going to tell you a if it's compatible and b um give you a good selection on prices and there's um, ratings too people have already built them <laughs> will rate them so if you're wondering do i go with this motherboard or this one well this one has a thousand five star ratings this one has zero ratings i wonder which one i should go with and that's sometimes that helps too Good deal. Well, today got me pumped up and I got a little more motivation than I did last month. So thank you again for everything. And uh, we'll see you next time and talk to you in the chat room. Thank you again. Very welcome, sir. Thanks so much for the call. That's I think that's what it takes sometimes. Just a little bit of motivation. Get things going. Get the blood pumping. Let's go to 
I'm motivated to go to the 786 area code. Caller, what's your name? Uh, where are you from? Hi, how's it going, Professor? Hey. I'm sorry I have zero voice today. <laughs> I'm getting um, there. It's Hassan from LA. Welcome. <clears throat> what can we do for you? Thank you, thank you. Okay, so quick question. I'm not going to keep you for long. Um, I usually see that um, the Security Plus videos for the 501, yes, yes. I am going to use that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah, so the Security Plus, uh, the 501 videos, you keep uploading them. Like, I see the new videos popping up at yes. every now and then. Um, so, I mean, is it done all the way or you're going to, are there more, is there more course work coming up or what's going on with that? There, There's plenty going on with that. For those of you that have not been kind of watching on the Security Plus side, there are, uh, Security Plus was updated in the October to uh, from the SY0 501, the 501 exam was released in October, and currently there's an overlap period of about six months while, where you could take either the 401 exam or you could take the 501 exam. Now, both of those exams from Security Plus are very different. These are extensively different exams, uh, but I have been adding and updating my 501 course. So right now, as of this morning, I added three more this morning. So there's 85 videos out there right now uh, for a total running time of nine hours and 32 minutes. And I have section one, section two, technologies and tools, section three, architecture and design. In fact, we're finished. If you look at the exam objectives, we have just finished section three uh, as the video online. And I'm working on the section four videos right now. We've uh, already got a lot of the videos that have been shot. So they're sort of in the can waiting to be edited. And then I edit. And as I edit and produce, I'll stick them online. So I'm I'm more than halfway through. There's probably going to be about 150 videos. And I'm up to video 85. So that should give you some idea. And if you look at the exam objectives, I'm just following the exam objectives. Okay. All right. Because my exam is scheduled for the 7th of February. So, and your videos is the only way that I get to study. I watch the video first and then I go to the book. So I was just wondering because these videos keep like coming up and I was like, okay, should I wait? Should I reschedule my exam? What should I do? Well, don't, don't be, don't worry too much about me. I don't know if I'm, I am, I would love to get these done by the end of January. Uh, I slacked a little bit at the end of December because it's the holidays and I went on a vacation and we did all, right. but now I'm back in the, in the studio this past week. I shot, I don't know, 15 or 16 videos. I shot a lot. Um, and so I, I just I posted three. So I've got a bunch of videos that are sitting there waiting for me to get edited. Uh, I'm trying to get a lot of them shot now because I can talk, because I never know day to day, what if I wake up and I'm not feeling well, and I can't talk like this, hi, welcome to the training course. Nobody wants to listen to that. <laughs> so if I'm in a good health, I like to shoot the video, so at least it's on disk, at least it's on the SSD and it's stored somewhere. And then if I'm sick, I can edit. You know, you're not listening to me as I edit. I can go ahead and go through the process of editing. Uh, that's the real, that's, it's kind of a rote process. The course is done. The course is completely written. Uh, my course notes, for example, are complete. The course notes were built from the course, but I haven't actually shot the video for the final video yet. It's kind of a weird process that I've got. So right now, I'm just in the studio every day. I'm writing content for the next week, and then I'm doing nothing but shooting video, shooting video, shooting video. And I, I can really only shoot about two or three hours of video a day because after a while, it does start to turn into something like that. Um, and I just pace myself. Um, but you're right, going right. to see a huge chunk of videos come out. I'm practically done shooting all of Section 4. Uh, that's a ton of videos. That's about 12 or 15 videos. Then section five is big and section six is pretty big. So we're getting there. Uh, I'm going to be putting them out as quickly as I can possibly do that because people like you need to be able to, to use them. And I'd like to be done with it already, quite honestly. Right. So it's section five and section six that's left. It's it's four, five, and six, actually. I'm, I think uh, if I look at the, what's out there, I just finished posting the last of section three. You know, I've, section four is in the can. You haven't seen it yet. I haven't edited the video yet, uh, but I'm pretty much ready to get that edited. I'm done today talking after this. I'm not going to talk anymore today on video. Uh, I'm going to edit more this afternoon. So there might be two or three more okay. that come out over the next couple of days. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm most likely going to uh, um, order the uh, exam, uh, the study guide that you have pretty soon as well. That may be a so good uh, a good way to know what's coming up on the videos before you even see them yet because they're already in the book. Oh, great, great, perfect. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for calling. That's uh, always useful to know too. Yeah, the book is done. The course notes are done. I write the entire course first so that I can then make the course notes and then I go through the process of actually shooting the video. So that's why the course notes are out and they're done. And you're, wow, these are finished. How am I getting course notes from a course that doesn't exist? That's how the course does exist. I just haven't got there yet. This caller has been holding, you've been holding a long time. Thank you, 773 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, Hi. Professor, my name is Mark. Welcome. What can we do for you? Yes, coming from Chicago. Oh, very good. The Windy City. What can we do for you, sir? Uh, very cold city, so you're lucky you live in Florida. That's beautiful. You enjoy it. That's why you look so good and fresh, because you, you live in Florida. You're right, sir. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Professor, I have a question that it might not be really in the subject of A+. Plus, it's quite all right. What it is, is I'm trying to uh, pass my exam in uh, Cisco, CCNA. Sure. And I need to set, uh, I need to set up a real environment for myself to have a hands-on for, you know, uh, including switches and router. Can you give me any information about how would I be able to set up a small network at home? How many switches do I need? What kind of writers do I need to be able to practice hands-on the commands? They call it CLI, command line interface, to get ready for your exam, which is, is very difficult, and I've been, you know, trying to learn it. But I need a hands-on practice also. Uh, it might be off the subject, but I would appreciate your input because you have so much knowledge and really a world of knowledge. I'd appreciate your answer. Thank you very kindly, sir. And enjoy good weather. And Chicago is very cold. <laughs> Stay warm, sir. Uh, and and the question you have is a very very good one. And you are absolutely right. The exam for Cisco is extensive with hands-on. Extensive hands-on. I highly recommend if you're planning to take, well, there's no question. It's not just a recommendation. If you're planning to get a Cisco certification of any kind, there will be a lot of hands-on. So make sure that you plan for that. Now, how you get the hands-on, there's a lot of different options. So the real question a lot of people come up with is, do I get Cisco equipment and equip myself? Do I purchase a set of equipment? You can buy an exam equipment set on eBay for $300, $400. They ship you three routers and three switches, and you can they ship you a little rack to put them in, and you can build them all out, and they ship you cables so that you can connect them all together. That's an, that's a, that's an, that's a completely viable way to do it because you're going to be doing a lot at the command line, a lot at the command line, and having the physical switches allows you to really see how they're connected together. So you can go from Ethernet 01 here to Ethernet 03 over here. You see the wire, it's connected, and it's more visceral. There's, there's a physical thing that you're working with that might help with your learning process. Now, in reality, when you work with this equipment, you put it in a rack, you're never going to see it again. And whenever you're working in a job with Cisco equipment, you never really see the Cisco equipment. Very rarely. You'll go into the data center sometimes. But most of what you're doing is from your desk. And the equipment's in a closet somewhere or in a data center. So it's interesting that we, we have all of these tools that we buy so that we can learn and get certified. But in reality, we almost never touch these, these things in, in the real world. So, But whenever I did my Cisco, I got actual equipment. Um, and there's a couple of good reasons for that. But Cisco makes available Packet Tracer, which you've probably seen. It's now absolutely free for anyone to use. That didn't used to always be the case. It used to be that you had to take a Cisco course to, to legally gain access to use Packet Tracer. Now they make it available to everybody. So you're welcome to, to take advantage of that as well. Packet Tracer for the, CIS, the CCNA routing and switching exam which would be the ICND-1 and the ICND-2 exam. They, that certification, it probably gets you 90% there, 9-0. Almost, you know, the last 10% isn't covered in Packet Tracer. And you may be able to read about that, uh, but those are the situations that that 
is when it's really nice to have your own hardware because then you can recover from a lost password, which is something that's not easily done in Packet Tracer. And there's a number of routing protocols and capabilities that aren't available in Packet Tracer. When you're trying to determine, you're trying to set up NTP between all these devices, a lot of the NTP commands aren't in Packet Tracer. So you never have a chance to use them. Uh, so and that's one option. There's other third-party options out there as well from other manufacturers, other companies that make a simulation environment that you could use that's sort of packet tracer-like. You know, Boson makes one like that. Uh, but you've got options. And um, I love the idea of physical when you're learning, but I also recognize a lot of people can't afford a few hundred dollars. Packet tracer gets you almost all the way there. So you've got some... You got some options and some balancing acts that you could do that would get you what you need and still be able to get the hands on that are necessary to pass that certification. Yes, sir, that's wonderful uh, information you gave me. I really appreciate your uh, lectures and your videos. Uh, please, uh, my uh, best wishes for you for a happy new year and a healthy and uh, successful year for you because we really. I really appreciate your guidance, and many people do. I know many people do. Thank you very much, sir, and God bless. Thank I, you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Happy New Year to you as well and to yours. It's going to be a fun year. It's going to be an interesting year. If nothing else, it's going to be an interesting year because it always is. That's the way it works with IT. There's always something new. When I started into IT, there was no 100 megabit Ethernet. There was no Internet. Uh, there was not the concept of streaming live to the world with beautiful HD audio and video. It just didn't exist. There was no such thing. So I love that uh, this whole evolution of whatever this is that we're doing has gotten us to this point. It's just going to be more of this coming. It's going to be a completely different world in 10 years. In 20 years, I can't even imagine. I can't. Uh, that's, that's the part that's fun to me about IT. That's the part to me that keeps me going is there's always something to learn. It's always something different. The reality we live in today is going to be a completely different one in 10 years. And in many ways, I envy those of you who are just getting into the industry. You know, you're going to be working with operating systems. You're going to be working on networking. You're going to be doing virtualization. You're going to be doing security, whatever it is, you're going to be doing it. And you're going to have a plan on what you'd like to do with it. But sometimes, right out of the blue, this weird thing shows up. Maybe it's blockchain. There's the latest thing from the last couple of years. So maybe there's this new technology that suddenly takes off, and you've just grabbed onto it, and it's dragging you along. That's, I think, part of the fun of this. That's the beauty of IT, and I think that's what a lot of people could take advantage of when you start getting into what do I do next? Sometimes you don't make that decision. Sometimes the decision's made for you, and you're just kind of holding on and going with the flow. Sometimes that's the best times of all. It uh, it's just depends on how much you'd like to do and wherever you're going with it. Uh, so let's uh, quickly to the chat room. Got another few questions. Um, uh, Matt is saying Microsoft has free hands-on labs. They have, they have a limited number of hands-on labs. They certainly don't have a comprehensive list that correlates back to CompTIA's exam objectives. Uh, that's one of the advantages that the live labs have from GTS Learning. I am familiar with them. You have to run them in Windows with Internet Explorer on Microsoft Labs. <laughs> and they, as long as you do that, they work. By the way, there are ways to get operating systems from Microsoft. Uh, if you go to modern dot ie m o d e r n dot ie it will take you to the microsoft edge site and under their tools pull down menu are virtual machines and you can download windows 7 windows 10 windows 8.1 from here for use in your lab that's exactly what it's designed to be you cannot use this for production use in fact so if you need a very inexpensive way to download a virtual machine and run windows 7 and run windows 8.1 for your exam there's an easy way to do it. Make your own lab. You don't need anybody else to be able to do it. You can run it all on your own desktop. Obviously, you need to download that. It uses local resources, but just another way to do it. And it's free. Microsoft just gives it to you uh, to be able to do that. So there's an option there as well. Another from the chat room, uh, any ideas of jobs that involve some programming but don't involve sitting around a chair all day? Uh, I th There is. 
it's, those are kind of more unusual. You know, programming application development is one where you're really sitting in front of a screen and you're developing the app. But not all application development works that way. Of course, product management and application product management is not one that has almost any programming skills required or time required. You're going to meetings and you're meeting with customers and you're trying to put together strategy for the future and you're trying to piece it together. Also, you can write your own apps and put them in the app stores that are out there. Sell them yourself. There's options to do that. And then you get to decide how often you'd like to sit in front of a screen. I, you don't know that that's even possible till you try to do it. And I, I, for instance, spent most of my career traveling. I have a million miles on Delta and a million miles combined on all the other airlines. I traveled internationally and did tons of technology and enjoyed it every bit of the way. But at some point, you think, I sure would like to stay home a little bit. What if I had a job where I could stay home and do videos and put them online? Can you really make a job out of that? Is it? Can you really eat? Can The children, they like to have food and clothing. Uh, but you don't know if you can to try it. So maybe you put together a strategy. What type of application could you build that people would want to buy? How much of it would they want to buy? How much of it could we expand on? And boom, you've got a business plan. Because that's what a business plan is, is you're coming up with an idea and figuring out how to make a goal from that business, how to make a goal from that idea. Maybe that's to make money. Maybe it's to provide a service. Maybe it's to get another job. Maybe it's any one of those things. There's lots of ways that you could do application development and find ways to make that application development work for you. It doesn't have to be you sitting in a chair all day. And we're not talking about just standing up all day. We really do mean doing different things. Um, if you want uh, uh, flexibility, you have to make it yourself. If you want to have a job that's a certain kind, you're the one that has to go get that yourself. It's not just going to happen. It's just not going to show up. You've got to think about what you want to do, figure out a way to get there, build the path. And sometimes it's you building that path and making the path yourself while other people are telling you you can't do that. Uh, but nobody else knows if you can do it until you do it. And that's really the difference. Uh, my goal for you is to fail miserably and then get up and just keep going. That's how you really know if you're ready to go. Uh, you can figure out what's wrong with it, adjust, and then keep moving that direction. You're going to be just fine and, and having all of those pieces there. Uh, application development, may, you may start in the chair. You may start traveling. You may start doing that thing that maybe not necessarily you want to do, but that will lead to giving you the flexibility to do other things. And that may be the way to do it and working with those pieces. Also in the chat room, uh, people asking uh, any word on the new Network Plus coming in the summer 2018, changes, updates. Uh, Network Plus, uh, it's probably going to be updated probably in March timeframe. That's when the last update was three years ago, was March. So I expect there'll be the new Network Plus exam will be delivered in March. The exam objective is already available for you to download from the CompTIA website. Uh, it's remarkable how little has changed with networking. And that's kind of normal with networking. The Security Plus exam that's recently updated, half of the content was new. And, and part of that was due to CompTIA restructuring their security certifications because they've added on other security certifications uh, over the years. But I just went through the entire Network Plus exam objectives. I, uh, I do an outline and map it all out before I get started. I've already started building that content. And it's uh, almost nothing has changed. There's very little that has changed on the new Network Plus. Uh, I would not wait, never, never, never wait for a certification ever, ever, because it's just the exam. Whether you take the existing Network Plus or you take the new exam that comes out in March or whenever, you still get the same certification. There's no difference in the two. I don't know why anybody would ever want to wait. Uh, there's too much value at having that certification in your pocket right now. And this current exam, they're probably not going to stop uh, giving until the fall. So you've got nine months before that exam ever goes away. You've got plenty of time to take Network Plus. And that's a good exam. That's a good certification to have. Everything builds on the network. Your operating systems, your security, your databases, your virtualization, your cloud, everything builds on the network. So Network Plus, anything relating to networking is a good one to have. Always, always, always. Well, we've come to, alas, the end of the live stream. Can you believe it? We made it this long, 
and you stuck in there. Good for you. I want to thank everybody for joining me. Would not be able to do these live streams without you. That first hour was so good. We were able to go through so many different questions, thankfully. Uh, but now our time has come to an end. I like that uh, we at least have some time on the phone lines today. I want to appreciate I thank so much my appreciation to everybody who called in uh, and asked questions in the chat room. Always helps to have that there. Thanks for sticking around. We do another one of these next month. I do another one of these for Network Plus next week. So if you want more Q&A and you want more to call in and just want to call in and open phone lines, you're more than welcome to call in with that one as well. Thank you for joining us this time, and we will see you next time on the A-plus study group.